What's up, everybody? I'm Cheech. You're listening to the On The Water podcast. Thank you for tuning in. I'm here with my good friend, Jimmy Fee, who's not allowed to say anything because he can't catch a tuna when everybody else is. Lucky hats aren't working, nothing. He is on a vicious, vicious streak of going tuna list. I think it's over 10 trips where the boat had... You know, often cases, multiple tuna landed. He wasn't one of the anglers that was able to get that done. Um, on the Dom trip with Captain Dom Petraca, who is going to follow this piece right here with an awesome, awesome podcast. Jimmy went. Uh, he hooked one fish at the end and, and broke it off. Then we got out about a week later. I want to say we hooked over 20 probably. Uh, we blew up like three rods. Uh, went like two and a half for, for 20 plus hookups. It was one of those days where it was like anything from an 80 pounder to an 800 pounder was getting hooked. People's gear was blowing up like crazy. And uh, he couldn't even get it done on that trip. So vicious streak for Jimmy. That's why he's not allowed to speak during this introduction for our next guest, Captain Dominic Petraca from Coastal Sport Fishing Charters. Like I just mentioned, we got out with Captain Dom for um, an epic day of jigging giant bluefin on light gear. Uh, it was a master's class in everything on how to prep for the trip, how to go and execute it, and how to get the job done. Captain Dom has the slips of fish getting to the truck uh, that are giants uh, caught on light tackle um, to the point where he's pretty comfortable saying he's caught the most giant bluefin tuna on light tackle than anybody alive. That's because you couldn't do that 20 years ago. It, you know, the advancement of, of the gear and the, the braid and everything that he's going to kind of dive into on this podcast um, has allowed him to do that, and he's one of the best going. Um, an absolute blast to fish with and a super knowledgeable dude when it comes to bluefin tuna. So thanks for tuning into our podcast. And I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you that after the podcast, Captain Dom took you on literally a deep dive of his favorite weapon of choice from the rod butt all the way to the tip, every connection in between, the reel he prefers, the rod he prefers, uh, the knots, the connections, the jig he prefer prefers. That is up live right now on our, po on our uh, YouTube page, um, On the Water, YouTube. Check it out. Again, thanks for tuning in uh, and wish Jimmy luck on his next tuna trip because, man, oh, man, the kid needs it. The kid's in a dark place. So, Jimmy, unless you have something to add, no, all right. Again, the On the Water podcast brought to you by Guidesley. Thanks for tuning in. Here's Captain Dominic Petraca, Coastal Sport Fishing Charters, Bluefin Tuna Fishing. Enjoy. The On the Water podcast is brought to you by Guidesley. Are you looking to book a fishing trip with a renowned hand-selected expert in the field? Guidesley has the best guides in the best destinations. Whether you've never fished before or you're a regular on the water, let Guidesley hook you up with the best captains in your area. They'll put you on the best catches of your life. You can search and book your dream trip now on Guidesley.com or download their app, Guidesley Fishing Trips. Book a Guidesley trip today and create memories that will last a lifetime. Welcome to another episode of the On The Water podcast presented by Guidesley. I'm Cheech. I got Jimmy Fee here and one of the saltiest captains we know, Captain Dom Petraca from Coastal Sport Fishing Charters. Welcome, uh, welcome aboard, Cap. Yeah, thank you, thank you. It's nice to be able to say that instead of the other way. Actually, no, the other way around is way better. <laughs> <laughs> we just experienced that firsthand. But um, yeah, we're so super psyched to have you today, bud. No, oh, thanks for having me in. Dom, man, I, I want to talk about, you know, what's it been? 20 years of chasing bluefin tuna on light tackle now? Just about exclusively anyway. I mean, I chased a lot of things back in the day, but once that first bite of the bluefin gets in your blood it venom creeps and starts to penetrate and for a lot of folks like myself it's a, it's a lifelong affliction that just only gets worse <laughs> not better but before that you worked on a headboat before that right i worked on headboats uh i worked for private captains uh did my own commercial fishing back in the day 
Um, started out in a in, in a black watch actually, a twin screw thirty one black watch. When I finally started to guide, had the captain's license after the time aboard the other boats. Um, my probably my favorite part of it was the head boat though, working on the American Classic with uh, Captain Jim and the. It's boys. a legendary boat, man. It, his dad. I started out uh, fishing. The very first experience I had was uh, on the Amberjack, his dad's first boat there, um, back in the half day trips. And uh, when they moved up north and got the the new Classic, he had it built. Um, I fished on that a couple times and just immediately felt the need to immerse myself fully in that snowball cod and the, and the spring haddock trips and uh, i was fortunate enough that jimmy and i hit it off real well and uh valuable valuable experience valuable part of my career um probably the most poignant part about it is the customers and uh, <laughs> learning how to deal with them that was a uh, rough and tumble crowd um met a lot of great people learned a lot of um not only fishing experience through jimmy but uh how to run a boat properly uh, how to take care of a boat. Uh, pretty much a lot of the guys involved in the industry forget that uh, everything you have came from somebody else. And so a uh, combination of the commercial fishing, running on my own, following um, one of the legendary guys around back when I was young. and I'm still dumb, but uh, back before when I didn't have that discretion, I followed Captain Al Anderson around a few times and provoked the ire of that great man. Uh, you want to think I'm salty, that guy was... <laughs> Wow. And he's, ta he's tagged more bluefin tuna than, Correct. than anybody. Correct. And so that That's was great. where sort of the bug started to come. I was doing um, an awful lot of combination trips, shark fishing, um, bottom fishing, jigging. I was always into the artificial even back in the day. But um, the bluefin thing came full circle for me um, as a kid getting on the boats um, with relatives and, and neighbors. It was always down in the middle of Cape Cod Bay. Uh, on like somebody's Penyan 26 or something with sometimes hand lines and hand baskets. And then there was the mud hole bite um, every year where I'd be able to jump on board throughout my teenage years and get some exposure to those big mud hole fish that used to come around before the mid 90s. And, um, you know, everything I learned, I sort of learned from that culmination of, of, of different events and facets. And the, the first bluefin light tackle experience I had was actually on a old green 702 or whatever those pens used to be wow. with a cedar plug of all things, you know, coming home from, um, from the East grounds one day, those baby bluefin, when I say babies, they were, you know, pretty small, 15, 20 pounders. It would be around in August milling at the surface and it started way back then. And then, you know, it kind of faded until braided line became available and with the kite industry and the advancements they made that got us to where i am today which is all light tackle pretty much for the most part i've dabbled a little in the last few years with some stand-up but like I when you say the kite industry you're talking about the rods like i mean the kites the yeah. kites in the in the air not only the spars and the, and the tapers on our rods but the line that they started with eyes line back in the day um that was developed through the kite industry wow so it, it, it came into the fishing world and once you got braided line braided line was the key to the capacity issue to start and then the real manufacturers and the rod manufacturers caught up a lot quicker than we did you know the gear gear was available and we went through a lot of years of breaking and busting a lot of stuff to get where we're at today but since about 2009 the the gear has been you know advanced enough i would say and you know there's been a few you know changes that have improved some things but um we've had gear available for these bigger fish since about the 2009 2010 season yeah because it was the early 2000s when you started to see that big boom of this uh, that's what i associate with the beginning of like the light tackle yes, tuna that craze. year class that yeah. 2002 2003 year class that um you know was just extremely prolific they had an affinity for the southern new england waters and they continued to come back year after year it was that first batch where Small ones were not only up and on the grounds, they were down in the lower bay. I mean, when I say down in the lower bay, I mean thick in the lower bay. And it was something that hadn't been seen in, in many a year, um, probably since way back in the, the Barnstable days before the White Dove uh, with the fish weir. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people don't know there was a cannery down in the lower bay and a fish weir that extended out from shore that um, had some amazing catches. If you look at the annals and the records, which are available to people, if you do a little research, you can see that small fish were always landed inside those nets. Some of them in some pretty amazing months. Is he still around? I don't know. 
my brother was in contact with him for uh, for a while. Could and be. He was still fishing. He was inviting him down to Florida to fish. And, he, and my brother's like, I gotta find out if if because I I want to fish with him, and that would be legendary. Yeah, yeah. insane, yeah. insane. When you say impressive months, like what what do you mean? Like what what were they saying? If, if you look, there were some winters there where in you know January and February you'd see some landings, and you know these fish, I think. Um, the whole, we don't know enough about them, number one. We were just talking about this before we got on camera with the scientists and the, and the, and the life cycle, the ecology of the fish, but um, it's an amazing animal. It's hardy, it's the top of the food chain, it's designed perfectly for what it does, and um, the fecundity of that animal is insane. They, they give birth to millions of young that do well. And so um, despite being chased and highly pursued, these fish are, uh, are certainly prolific and, and abundant, um, especially over the last, I'd say, you know, five or six years, we've seen a crazy uptick in the numbers, not only of large fish, but small fish. Oh yeah, and, and uh, the popularity has certainly never been higher. So yeah, it, they've yeah. always been, been popular, but um, with the advent of the internet and um, you know, the availability and then the flavor of the week disease, I call it, where, <laughs> whatever's hot and these fish um they're around and then they're they're a little bit easier to catch in recent years but um they're sort of like that 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 upper pinnacle it's it's a fun fish to catch no no doubt about it but it's a difficult fish to catch so why why that change cuz cuz i've noticed that it's it's gotten easier to catch them well it's easier to hook them than it seems like it was you know, whether you're doing the jig and stuff or whatever you're doing. It, what, what, I think that's makes... all predicated upon the bait, truthfully, in the bait cycles. Um, the fish hasn't changed its its movement. There are certain, um, you know, areas that are known to congregate and hold bait, which then bring the bluefin in. But sort of like game trails on land, um, there's, there's paths that these fish follow that are conducive not only to forage, but um, an easier route. There's currents and, and upwellings involved, and they like a mixture of cold water to retreat to and warm water near the surface so that they can digest better. And there's all sorts of other things, of course, that are more questions than answers in my brain anyway. And um, it, I think really it comes down to the bait. Uh, it used to be super easy back in the day. It, it, you know, you, you could go out there, Helen, Helen Keller could be driving the boat with Ray Charles casting and you could catch a few, <laughs> 2006, 7, 8, 9. Um, and then I saw a change in about the 2012 season where it you, got real difficult. Do you so think I remember that. The, so that, that's, uh, I'm, I'm sorry yeah, to cut no you worries. off, man, but I remember I first moved up here in 2008 and it seemed like everybody around that was going out, the light tackle thing was, was, was great. Then the fish seemed to get a little bit bigger. Something shifted with the bait, and then it was tough for a few years, and a lot of guys moved on. Like a lot of guys who were tuna guys, so they're Some going to switch gears. They started to do, um, you know, fluke trips. They started to do other things. Um, I don't want to mention any names because you know it's it. But a lot of the captains, um, a lot of my peers, kind of gave up, and, and and not so much gave up, but switched gears, um, introduced other species and other methods. More importantly, a lot of the light tackle aficionados. Um, without that top water bite that everybody wanted, um, there was an awful lot of endless searches in, in my career and other careers where you would take clients out and kind of explain to them that you know, you're just you're not seeing that anymore. There's nothing at the surface. And um, me, my, 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 my background, I think, gave me a little bit of a better, well-rounded approach to these bluefin in that I used to jig them back off Block Island. And um, the guys down in New York and New Jersey will testify to this. They had a few seasons interspersed in ours where there was a real hot, you know, mid lane, mid near shore um, jig bite on the lumps. And, and, and jigging was a lot more popular down south. And so it was already in my blood. Um, I think it was September 13 or whatever was that first year that um, we started banging those bigger fish on the jigs down off the, the Regal. And, um, I remember that season vividly where there were an awful lot of people saying that there was just nothing going on and I put it together, saw it on the finder, started to get back to the roots. We started jigging and we kept it quiet for about a week, week and a half. And then the wagon wheeling as we were tight started with the boats all down there trolling, getting closer and closer to us. And by the end, it was 75 or 80 boats all drifting in unison together, much like it, it is today because that, that bite's been... Semi-reliable, I guess you could say, in that um, deep water bluefin has been the, the way you've had to go. Yeah. Um, trolling the squid bars doesn't work much anymore. Chasing these fish around and throwing top water plugs. A lot more work involved. 
Um, and so I think that's why the, the, the shift in the, in the paradigm, so to speak, with the, with the other light tackle guys, I've dedicated my, my career to chasing that one fish and in one certain method. So it's kind of hard to get rid of that once you build it up. And oh, people. Yeah. So, so basically, you know, these fish remained here, but they became less visible because the bait had them feeding, you know, at the bottom Deep. instead of at the top. And so it wasn't visual, correct. visual, and, and then a lot people of times, moved on in a lot of cases. Zero indication other than a few surface things. A lot of these areas that we're fishing and you would look at and you say, well, there's a couple of whales, but there might not be anything here. So it, it, you know, that's where the, not only the experience, but, um, you know, the modern technology we got now with the, with the, with the finders, the sonar is just. Just going to go there. Like, you know, how is that, how has that evolved to help you, you know, be a, a better captain mm -hmm. on the water? It's light years of advancement in just a short period of time with the, the sonar in particular, um, you know, it started out much in many people's lives with a little ticker or a little flasher with some color that would indicate that there might be something underneath or the old paper graph. Paper graph. Um, and then that moved in and Furuno kind of was the, the, the pinnacle of, of bottom machines throughout the earlier part of my career, that Furuno 585. Um, just a really good machine that would give you a lot more idea of what was going on underneath your boat. And then we got into the chirp frequency and the different frequencies. And that's all just been within the last, say, like 10 to 15 years. Yeah. Um, you know, Airmar was making a lot of transducers for a lot of people, but um, now there's a lot more choices and there's a lot more things at your fingertips, a lot different frequencies, side scan, down imaging. There's, so it's amazing what that has done for the ability to find those deep water fish. Yeah, you were showing us just the other day how the down imaging gives you just where you're seeing tuna you wouldn't otherwise see like the tuna you showed us beneath the whale when a whale you see through. things with that new that, that down imaging is just it's it's the it's the cat's meow it really is it's it's that amazing in the difference in the ability to break down those big red blobs um those little tracks that you see out we call scratches it might be a fish that's just outside your your beam and so you know he might have been there um that down imaging run at the same time on my boat with the traditional 2d and i can fiddle with the different 2d you know the 50 the 200 i can get a medium chirp i can get a low chirp um, but i can also do down imaging or side imaging with the same machine and those are completely different frequencies for me, that down imaging with that hummingbird system that I've been in for the last few years is just, it's insane. What you see, the clarity, the, the distinction, you can see peck fins, you can see carbuncles on tails as they turn. I've found four wrecks down in the, in the channel now that are, you know, I would have never known what they are. They look like a red bump on a traditional finder. And with this down image, it breaks down all the structure that you're looking at. And you can clearly see pilot houses and you can see there's a, a commercial dragger I found that's, uh, I don't know, in 230 feet of water, it comes up to like 185, 186 with the relief. But you can see the, 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 the wheelhouse, you can see the, the rudder, you can see the propeller. It's, that's why. it's nuts. And without that detail before, it literally looked like a little rock on the bottom. Correct. And then you, now you see what it is. And then you were, actually brought us over to one and was showing us this. And what was above it? <laughs> oh, so, you know, as bluefin. we came over and, and we were sitting there breaking it down, I looked on the machine and, and said to Al, Adam, you know, and the funny thing is there's a tuna over it right now and I look out of the corner of my eye I see a little bit of motion <laughs> <laughs> there's two pieces of metal hurtling to the bottom despite my chagrin <laughs> um, yeah that, that's actually pretty funny stuff because uh, we, we had we had filmed an episode of On the Waters Angling Adventures that uh, will be out um, early next season and you know we had a, an incredible day it got to the point where Dom was like listen um you know, at some point, it's no longer fair to you guys to put yourselves through this again after after fighting fish for over three hours, a 90 inch class fish, 100 inch class fish on the light gear, getting them to the boat, leader to hand. And then, you know, it's like and then it's also not fair to the fish if you guys are totally worn out and, you know, I can't be of much help. I've had a back surgery, this and that. So, like, let's call it. So, you know selfish me sees that there's some fish down there and i, I drop and i'm trying to jig quietly right <laughs> I, I saw cheech drop and i go it gives me the well, look 
I mean, if, if he's doing if it. If you're going to do it, I'm going to do it. But the best part about it is we had some stuff that we had to finish up for, you know, getting the TV show kind of, you know, putting a fork in that um, accent stuff. And we're running the boat towards a whale feed. And we start to come off a plane and slow down. The drone's up in the air. And as soon as we slow down and Dom's machine uh, clears up, he's like, oh, my God, look at this pile of fish. And he makes a beeline to the rod and drops down. And I'm like, well, if the captain's doing it, I'm doing it. And we're all laughing. Like, you, you know, just can't help yourself. That's the insanity of what you can't help it. It was it was that was a, such a great time. I mean, the ability to catch fish this size on that on the gear that, that you're doing it with, like Cheech, I can go out there. We can we know all the connections. We know the right rods. We know the reels, the line. But when you were starting that, that that information didn't exist. There was so much trial and error that went that into that stuff. Still there. I mean, you can get that. I've done a, a thing for you guys that shows the the basic approach. And I think the rigging factor is something that um, for a responsible approach to using light gear on large fish, um, you got to get your rigging down square first and foremost. And there's an awful lot of conjecture about what's the best system. Um, mines remain unchanged since about 2009, 2010. I haven't changed a thing. I'm not going to change a thing because it's a system that I've proven time and time and time again. But there's a question that's been asked me and a question that's kind of tough in terms of like, do you like blurt it out with your ego? Is like, why do I get more of those big fish than other boats? And I think there's an awful lot more to it than just the gear. Um, the angler comes into play quite a bit. The choices that you make throughout a fight come into play a bit. And then there's things that you can do as a captain that will well, remain secret forever. You know, I've, I've, I've had a couple um, protégés under my belt, a couple guys that have spent some time with me. Um, they've been given a little bit as, you know, everybody else gets given by somebody. And then they're sort of like you can lead that horse to water but you can't make a drink you can lead that fisherman to the grounds he can have all the right gear on board i mean certainly that's something that has sort of leveled the playing field if you will with some of the the beginners some of the the, the people that are just getting into the sport it's all been done and now it used to be secret and passed on and used to be kind of like cherished and burned. yeah it's burned it was burned a long time ago um with the seminars and the, and the and the and the age of the ability for guys who normally wouldn't encounter one another they might own a boat they're interested in blue fin now they can get together in a chat room and they can do it all in private and they can share with each other the secrets you can come out with a guy like me and and i've always been kind of like open book because it, it's it's sort of like baseball or softball you can play on an intramural squad and you can have a bunch of guys that enjoy it and really aren't all that great at it. And you can do, you know, reasonably well, have a modicum of success. You throw a guy in there who's got a, you know, 12 to 6 curveball coming in at 85 and he's got high heat at 93, you might hurt yourself if you even make contact. And that's sort of what this light tackle game is about. Um, in any sport, I think one of the biggest problems today is, is that um, that old expression, I, I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn last night, but I am, a, you know, <laughs> qualified to, to do open heart surgery on you. Um, there's the instant ability to be successful immediately by going on YouTube, watching a few videos, having some money, buying yourself a nice boat, buying all the, the, the latest trendy gear, you know, understanding the connections and the knots you get down there. You're going to fumble around quite a bit if you, if you don't know what you're doing. And especially when you connect with these bigger fish. Um, something we talked about on the boat, there's a little bit of me that feels... Um, that some of this is irresponsible in, in, in not only like how I've promoted it and, and been able to show that there's some success. These fish are, are targeted heavily, as we know. Um, for the most part, I think a lot of the people that go down there have done that. They've seen the videos. They, they've seen that other people can catch them, and they sort of think, therefore, I can too. And there's an awful lot of fish down there that are trailing line because they don't understand drag systems. They don't understand what to do when the fish hooks up and turns into a larger animal. A lot of these jig bites, the fish just kind of bangs around a little bit and doesn't quite know what's going on, especially if you get them hooked right, where it's just that hook with the swing and the jig is on the outside of his face. Imagine like this big, huge animal that's, you know, swimming around minding its business, gets this tiny little pinprick sort of like, you know, just somebody pulling a little short and curly hair on you and, and they can't get anywhere. And so they kind of swim around like, what is this? The jig's out flashing in front of their face. It's like dark down there. So a lot of times when you hook one of those fish on these jigs, they don't do much. Yeah, there's a minute while they're trying to like, they're assessing the threat. Right, you know? right. And then, you know, the drag setting that these people have, they think is appropriate and, and it's not. You need... 
the drag settings that I use, that's the first thing I'll, I'll give everybody, your drag folks. Like just stop going after those fish on these noodle and light rods without understanding your drag system. Um, you have so much line capacity, you have a, a fish that's gonna take so much line. The key is, is understanding that you don't have enough to begin with. The drag may be enough but the angler attached to that jag is the is the weak part of the system, um, and then we can get in you know probably to talking about you know using overheads and conventionals like I prefer versus the spin rod. The spin rod is I mean it's literally the butter knife. You know at least with the conventional you got a, a sharp stiletto and you can do so a little bit more business. <laughs> but you're literally going to a, a, a gunfight with a with a with a knife and remembering that and the size of the fish underneath your feet. I, I'm torn with it every day. You know, is is it something that's re and for me, I think yes. I get a ton of them to the boat. I've I've landed them when the commercial season's open. I put a lot of really big fish on deck throughout my career. Um, I don't see a ton of other people doing that. I don't see a lot of a lot of other guys that can you know have the 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 sort of portfolio where they can say yeah I've handled you know 10 90 inch fish. I've I've handled a few hundred inch fish and successfully interacted with them and not left. 500 yards of braid trailing off that fish um yeah there's a responsibility to the fish and the, and the health of that fishery that you, you have to keep in mind and, and that's something that people aren't well here's my segue for that you know rather than fumble around and stumble around you got to understand like would you go out uh, a year into hunting and, and try to stock a big bull elk with a with, with a longbow no you'd hire a guide so hire me and i'll show you everything <laughs> you need to do and you'll get it done on my boat a little plug for coastal charters. I had the pleasure of fishing with you three times, man, and I, I, I learned so much from every trip. And it just, you, you come back with a lot of, I mean, it's 20 years of experience of, of looking at these fish. And, and it's a all you've done. of being yeah. enamored with them, but, you know, 20 solid years on these fish and only these fish has really. You I know, mean, I think uh, you said besides the harpooners, probably nobody looks at ocean looking for bluefin tuna over the course of the season more than you. Yeah. Ocean driving the miles. I mean, there's certainly guys that have been at this a lot longer than me, rod and reel, and 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 you know, a combination. There's even some some guys that have done both. You know, fantastic harpooners. They turn into great rod and reelers. Um, there's a, a bunch of commercial guys, but in terms of the guides throughout the years I, I don't see anyone out there bouncing around after them as long or as often i don't know anybody else who's exclusively tuna no, everybody I else don't does know, a little up here no i'm a one trick pony yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's a good trick yes yeah, it's a great trick i mean that was literally a, a you know every time we fish together it's a master's class in in your craft and and um it's it shows and, and it's pretty simple to figure out that like yes like Anybody can go and do that, but to do it the right way and respect the fish the right way so that you're not, you know, being reckless out there. Correct. Practice. You I know. mean, with any sport, you got to practice. Um, you know, for me, a lot, a lot of the guys ask, like, what can I do? There's not really, like, any sort of workout that's, that, that's <laughs> like, set for what the muscles and the, all the other stuff coming into play. Never mind that, um, the technique. And so the technique is, is, is key. It's, it's the determinant factor, um, not only with the people on the rods, but the guy at the wheel. Mm -hmm. um, and not only this, like the decisions that I talked about throughout the course of a fight, there's, there's uh, many times where these fish will exploit whatever advantage you give them. And being able to understand what's going on both above the water with the angler and below the water in conjunction with having rock solid confidence in your rigging. The, those are the three keys and that the, the practice is just something that you can't do on your own normally on a day-to-day -day basis unless you are a, you know really wealthy individual with a lot of time and um a lot of patience because you're going to have a lot of failures yeah. it, it's it, confidence in the connections i think is is numero uno because the heat that you have to put on consistently i don't think anybody fish. realizes i mean you two got a glimpse of that with that rod and reel and what i did to it throughout the fight what it started at and then what it finished at and i don't think people I, understand just without like thumbing the spool or really grabbing down the line i could not have broken that connection myself like i, I it I don't will think I break when it. i take the rod out now if you notice when i leader these big fish uh, uh, i try to explain to people it's the weight of the fish and i'm using 100 pound fluorocarbon and so it's not like i got 300 on this fish where i can leader it and successfully bring it around and take wraps and do what's that because once that rod comes out of play the give is gone there's only so much stretch you get out of fluorocarbon or even monofilament 
Um, and so when you're going to pop them off, it needs to be right there at the connection to your offering. And so whether it be a jig or a plug, I use plastic and I use metal like exclusively mm -hmm. throughout the course. You throw a little rubber in there, but you know, at the mo for the most part, it's, it's what I'm using. And you don't want to leave all of that in addition to a bunch of line. They're going to shake that hook. They're a fish that's really hardy. People don't give them enough credit. There's some photographs out there. There was one recently, I think it might have been Sam Law that put it up, where there was a hole all the way through the fish's gill plate. I yeah. saw that one. It looked like someone had shot it with a gun. <laughs> um, I've had fish with all sorts of things in their stomach. I've had fish with harpoon darts in their bodies. Um, yeah. I've had fish with one eye. I had one fish that had half of an eye. You just they're, they're amazing creatures. And so... If you give them the ability to just have a plug with a, a couple set of tin hooks or a jig, and the jigs fall out real easily. They're heavy. Their head shakes are so, so vicious. So they head they're shake and it's that. just gone. They're going to throw that right away without a line attached to it. And so it's a lot more responsible. You know, you get fish that hit sabiki rigs and they take the lead and they take all the thing with it. You got fish that get gut hooked. You got fish that get gill hooked. Um, they're really hardy creatures. They can survive an awful lot and, and go through an awful lot and be reasonably healthy by most standards and, and travel across the ocean and up and down the coastlines and feed, breed. Um, so but that, that, that's important at the, at the end of the day is when you are an angler, you talk about it in every targeted species that we as sportsmen go after is the responsibility of, of safe handling practices. And I, th I think there's a lot of things you can do with experience and by paying attention and also, you know, following the the rules, sometimes the regulations even, um, which will help those fish a little bit better when you're targeting them with, with this type of gear. And that's a, that's a thing. That's an important point. If you are catching a recreational tuna, the importance of report it, may, reporting your reporting catch. Reporting it, the way you handle it, um, understanding that, um, you know, you don't swing a gaff at the thing, you know, trying to, to, because it's green. You have to spend the time when you're recreationally fishing for these fish, especially if you make the decision after you harvest one to continue fishing. Um, you got to be able to release them safely, which requires you to bring those fish up, tire them out using the rod, the reel, and whatever you know tools you have, and then successfully removing the hook, the jig. And if you're not going to remove it, at least understand that if it's a large fish, your connections are proper. Where if you hold it, you're going to break it at the very bitter end, not somewhere in your main system above the leader. It's just walk, walk us through that process of, of, of um, you know, properly handling a fish that you intend to release. But once you get it to the boat, if once you're lucky you, enough, if you're to, lucky get enough to get them to the boat and you, 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 you can see them, you need to tire them out to the point where they're going to bob to the surface almost, go on their side, which then requires a, a bit of swimming afterwards. The smaller ones are a little bit easier to handle because they don't have the mass. Um, the drag can't get him away. And so you got him like a, a crazy dog on a leash. He's real tight. And you just let him tire himself out. The bigger ones, they just go and they go and they go and they find ways to get down into the colder water or they find a groove in your rhythm where they're allowed to get down and, and rest. And they're able to just sort of walk underneath you, I like to call it, where you just, you're walking that fish. You're not really fighting him. And he's sort of just maintaining enough strength where he doesn't need to exert a ton to get away from you. And he feels a little bit more safe and a little bit more comfortable. It's at that point where you can get him spinning. You can shorten those circles. And then it requires either a, a, a lip handling tool or a real thin gauge lip gaff, getting it in you know, right at the point of the lower lip. Um, and, and, and being real gentle about that because of where their heart is located in that throat area. As those gills come up, it's sort of right there, and there's not a big distance between that lower jaw and where you're going to get into things that are going to hurt them. So got to be safe. Tailing them, those tailors, I, I can tell you right now, those just don't work. Yeah. You're going to beat the hell out of yourself, the fish, and the, you know, everything else in the process. It's not good to you know grab a fish by the tail that wants to escape, especially when it's green. You can do a lot of damage. So it just it requires you putting that fish on its side, and that's hard to do. <laughs> it is. You have you have a you have a well placed lip gaff in in a, in a fish that you're going to re release. Where are your indications that all right, this fish is ready to be released? They now? start to you'll see a color change in these fish boats throughout a fight. Um, when fish are ready to be landed, they turn these bluefin anyway, and a lot of other fish, um, they lose a lot of that what we call lit up color. 
that excitement mm -hmm. uh, color phase that they show. So when you have a fish that's real hooded and dark and black on his back and he swims by you and all you're looking at is those, you know, penguin wings and that <laughs> fat head, you know, swimming by you and moving his tail and you can see the tail beats in the line. But that color is a real good indicator. When those fish are tired, they whiten out. They get gray on the, on the top and the black, and they get that mottled look to them. And then, you know, a lot of times when these fish come up and guys take too long, that fish is begging for you to help it out. Like, either kill me yeah. or, or give me a little bit of oxygen and help me out. It's at that point where, you know, it's safer and a, and a lot easier to handle. And then just take the time afterwards to... I do a lot of tagging. Um, I like to get my clients involved in the tagging. And, um, you know... I, it's, I get a charge out of that. Watch, I, I put up more recently, and I don't post a lot anymore. I haven't in the last few years. It's just gotten away from that um, for various reasons. Um, a lot of probably what's in this cup, coffee, and not the other stuff later in the day. <laughs> um, but it's it's the release, you know, knowing that you've just you know done battle with that warrior of the sea. It's 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 an animal that goes places that it just are amazing and astounding that you know of never mind what you don't and, and you watch it swim and kick away healthy you get a charge out of that so. oh yeah man and you've you've caught so, so you tag fish yourself you've caught tagged fish yes yep and have you ever had any returns on your tags you know i don't pay much attention the, the angler and the captain things when i fill those things out nine times out of ten like the angler like is all excited and they leave and so like i got an email address on the guy that booked the trip and i put it on there and then i write my name and my email address and off they go um, I've caught a lot of tagged fish myself. I, I, I haven't ton of tag, uh, a ta you know, tagged a ton of them, um, but enough of them. Um, the pop-up tags, I did some pop-up tagging with uh, Willie Goldsmith, who you guys know real well. I met him on the American Classic, actually. He's oh, yeah. like a 12-year-old kid. Um, but we went out and did a bunch of uh, tag research to see uh, post-release uh, you know, mortality. Yeah. And all but one of the fish we tagged made it and the one that didn't make it was eaten by a shark i read that I, he wrote that article up for uh, for on the water and yeah the one that didn't survive it looked like it got, it got eaten by a mako it traveled shark around yeah. at like 69 to 71 degrees or so in some pretty cold water there and popped up to the surface and moved too much to for it to be that so, so based on the stomach temperature i think of the shark was how to determine um you it's know the, the water that it was in it would have even been, either been it wouldn't have been that steady internal temperature yeah. and i guess that internal temperature is what a Mako runs that, so it sounds about right. <laughs> but watching them, you know, we had a couple that were hooked really bad. You know, one myself where it was, you know, travel hook in the, in the, it had thrown one of the travel hooks and it had swung around and it had ripped a little bit down near its throat area and it was bloody. That one made it just fine. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so I, but a lot of that too is you know how to release them properly as well. So yeah, if, if people take the time it. to yeah, learn yeah. it, they will live. Over the years, know. I've released more than I've harvested because you get those days, especially on the light gear, where you do you know eight or nine fish, and a lot of them get released. Um, a lot of them are, are long distance hook pulls. We get a lot of those gentlemen's releases. <laughs> um, but those aside, yeah, I bring an awful lot of those smaller fish up to the boat, and so you get a good sense of handling them and what you can and can't do. Um, the real small ones, it, it's actually a lot safer to get in and, and get a real good grip on them and get them up out of the water, leaving them in the water that way rather than put a hole in them. You can do that with those smaller fish. Um, once you get a little bit of a bulkier fish and they got that big gnarly mouth and, and their jaws are a little bit stronger, they're just too strong and you're afraid you're going to dig in and do some damage. So I, I recommend using either the lip tool or the gaff on anything over you know, 120, 130 pound class or so. You want to get the lip gaff in those 60 plus inch fish. So I, I wanted to talk about lures real quick. So over, you know, that has to be one area that's evolved a decent amount for you. From where you first started chasing them with the lighter tackle to where you are now, how much has lures changed? Other than changed? the through wiring, I mean, sorry, lure guys, but, you know, the, the, the basic mimicking of fish has been around since they started carving it out of bone. So there's a lot of talk about who did what and who did this and who did that. R R Rapala. And the Rapalas and the, and the Zara Spooks of, of old are basically what I'm throwing today. Um, they're a stick bait, you know, but the through wire, that, that, that through wire system allowed you to attach the hooks to the plug. When I first started, we had to take plugs that didn't have that through wire and rig assist cords with rubber bands and some other things to detach the lure. And that's where the assist cord, and there's a lot of guys that rig um, both topwater as well as jigs exclusively for me with the jigs. It's the only way I rig them is with that assist cord attached to the split ring and, and the solid ring. So that takes that jig out of play because a lot of jigs are just a piece of soft lead or some sort of other, you know, pot material that have been painted and coated. And 
there's not a lot of strength to them. So you want to take that out of the connection to the fish. And so that's changed, but the shape and the size and everything else, I mean, the cedar plug is kind of what we <laughs> throw. It's just got a little bit more accoutrement to it. You know, some paint. <laughs> a little bit more some human gills, catching. Some flair. Uh, yeah, they, yeah. They, these things are designed to catch, you know, yeah. fishermen. <laughs> not so much fish. The color spectrum, we don't even know if they see color the way we do because of the rods and the cones. And so do we, we see pink. What, is, what does that fish see? It's something that, you know, they think is blues and greens and grays, but um, they certainly don't have the ability to like take light, process it through their internal auditory and, and not auditory, but uh, oh, yeah, the visual. what the hell is the goddamn word? <laughs> <laughs> the word I'm looking for, the vis yeah, the visual, <laughs> ophthalmological, I don't know. <laughs> Too early in the morning for it, yeah. but... Um, that vision that they have, we don't know. We don't know what that is. And so do they process, you know, light and color the same way we do? I don't think so. I've never Certainly. had a fish answer. Yeah. Neither have I. Neither have I. So most important, so if you're looking for a lure, what's most important the to you? The silhouette, then? the shape, and then the way it's worked. Um, you know, what, what, what are you trying to mimic? And up here, you know, we've gone through countless arguments and, and fights and talks and chats as fishermen about what's the best bait to use. Well, what's the best artificial bait to use and, and there's everybody's got their favorite and their go-to but you got your basic stick bait um which may or may not have a lip which would then turn it into a crankbait um and then you have your rubber rubber tail with your your lead head which is designed to, to be jigged at a slower rate and then you have your metal jigs in addition to surface irons which they use on the west coast i don't use those here because you the tried birds. them at all yeah the birds they don't work? The birds. Oh, they oh, may the work, but they work really good for those goonies. Those shearwaters <laughs> just can't stay off those surface plagues. The faster you move it, the more excited the birds get, and um, it's a lesson in... in That's a big big factor in the topwater stuff. That, more so over the years. Um, you know, it used to be you could work around them and through them, and now with that same thing we're going through without seeing the stuff on the surface, these birds aren't getting fed as often because they're not driving the bait up like they used to. They're desperate. Those feeds of old, you know, I had a couple of them this year where it looked like maybe it was going to come around because the sand eels were back, and these fish would just stay in one spot and smash bait. for You guys put up that video that one day where I just, it was hours of that. I've never seen that. I, I didn't think that happened in the Northeast. I thought that was a Panama thing. It used thing. to in like 2007 and 8 out east and in some of those spots where I roamed where the fleets weren't fishing, you know, up on the bank or down, you know, off Chatham close to shore. Out in some of those deeper areas, we had some of those feeds back then. But from about 2012 on, they've just dwindled to the point of if there's not some half beaks around, you're not going to see a, a tuna jumping. And the half beaks over the last three seasons, get it, haven't seen it. I haven't it. seen it. Am I on any trips recently? But before we go into half beaks, that video we're talking about, uh, we posted on the On the Water Instagram, and it was just straight white water. It was like feeds a, like a as wa far as the eye could see. Whales involved, a lot of different mixed class species, predominantly, um, you know, a lot, a lot of different size dolphin are in the mix there, but a lot of different size bluefin as well. And the sand eels, they, the the one we harvested, you know, you had like some nine inch, some five inch, and some little like two and three inch, and he also had a couple of whiting like in his belly. So he'd been down on the bottom before coming up to the surface. Looked like a bloated beach ball or a little small baby <laughs> boat fender and the thing tried to eat a surface plug despite having that already in his stomach. So they're, they're eating machines. And um, at the end of the day, it's more important about where you're encountering them and how you're going to interact with them. The choice of plug, I tell guys a lot, just go with what you're confident with. Something that's effective that you feel, and it's something that gets down a little in the water column and gets underneath those birds. And then you've heard this out of my mouth a thousand times. It's your, your rhythm and your cadence. Slow mm -hmm. everything you're doing down. It's the most common thing I see amongst the troll fleet, watching those guys go by at like wahoo speed, <laughs> 12 knots. A lot of times with a guy up in the bow looking to cast at them. And you know, you, I don't care how good you are, you launch a cast even like way out in front of the boat. Never you're already by it. it. Yeah. So even if you yeah. do get a bite, you know, it's yeah. just not effective. And, and approaching those fish and the way they're approached, you know, over the years without those wild, crazy surface feeds where it was like jungle rules, like, yeah, half the pack and half the fleet, like roaring at Mach 1, trying to get there in time and various, you know, ways of approaching them most often just driving straight through the middle of the pile, which, by the way, does not work. <laughs> um, that stuff has, has, has gone away. And so that's kind of like improved like my whole mood of, of approach. I don't burn as much fuel. I don't have to be as aggressive. I don't have to, you know, really 
work not only trying to position the boat and be safe, but also box other boats out and fend off what you've sort of found. Now that stuff doesn't work. A lot of times guys will roll up on a few boats in an area and they don't like watching other boats wait and watch. So they move off and they move on and that has been like really successful for me. It's difficult as, as a charter captain, especially when you have to work around a fleet, you're gonna notice, you know, you're gonna get noticed, you're gonna get attention and you're gonna have other boats that you gotta work with. Um, which for me, it's, you know, I understand the arena that I'm in is, is, is wild to begin with, but you have people accessing it for all different reasons. Um, and so, I don't know too many other offices where you come in and you're dealing with hopped up eight year olds on sugar and, and Snickers bars and you got old crusty salty guys and then you got just the bewildered, you know, I like to call them the little bunnies that are out there that just have bright eyes and anybody catching anything? And, yeah, anybody catching anything, <laughs> fishing the boats, you know, you see a few boats and that's, you know, that's the common way now is you people glass you, they got the ability to use those amazing binoculars and radar and everything else. And so you got to learn kind of ways to get away from things. And this style of fishery, you know, where there's less surface feeds, you'll get them if you're patient and you understand like sort of that you're going to have to wait sometimes all day. And so you, you might go out and you want the top water. Well, we can do that, but that requires some maneuvering, sitting in an area, maybe coming back to an area. A lot of times I talk about it's, you know, the fish will be here, but it's not the right time yet. It's not the tide. It's not the time yet. We're in the right spot. It's just not now i i personally like the jigging like that that is uh, one because you spend more time with a line in the water and uh it does have the ability to surprise you a little bit because uh, like that we were talking about when we stopped and you were doing the uh, the hummingbird segment with adam filming that uh we had maybe we had just seen one on the screen but i hooked up briefly yes yeah and, and you go off a little bit of drag said, oh, <laughs> you turn and you go oh you're kidding me <laughs> uh, that's not what he said <laughs> didn't <work. laughs> not quite exactly I, I different totally choice of words and i was kind of nervous i was like oh man i don't i don't want to piss dom off here and then the validation was when he jumped into it and started and started those were, in my defense those were smaller marks and we were still trying to recover yeah. from the first morning's you know <laughs> incident with of course Cheech on the rod <laughs> had themselves a nice little sushi sized class fish all locked up early in the morning. He was quiet with the hookup, kind of snuck it in, and then he um, very boldly just let it go right in front of our eyes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I got shaved off. Um, yeah, probably what 10 or 12 minutes in, and yeah, he was right up, he was circling, he was you know that same size I've been seeing, you know, about 80 pounds, 100 pound animal, and he was gonna taste delicious. Yeah, you called your shot too. We were heading out and you're like, all right, first light, um, we're gonna have a shot at some smaller fish, then those fish will ultimately move on, and then as the day goes, the fish will get bigger. And and it was a 50 inch class fish, and then things kind of quieted down for a little bit, and we were like, you know, just being patient. Had to move around quite a bit. Move around, you know, eyes on the bottom, and found what you liked, and found a little bit more what you liked, and got tight again and that fish was a real one 90 inch or so it was like the herd moved in and then the next one was bigger it was tied if you noticed it it was tied and i explained that that, you know in the morning there when you roll down it was literally that the smaller fish were up on the surface and down underneath the boat in in big bass droves and much like they do they don't like to hang around in the same exact area the big fish push the smaller ones out i don't know if it's push the the smaller ones are a lot more willing to expend energy the smaller ones chase easier bait and with all that surface sand deal that we're seeing and not a lot on it not a lot of birds over it's because there's not a ton of whales there's whales and they're all in that one area but there's not a lot of minkies spread out through the grounds there's not a lot of finbacks this year and so there's not anything really to help those tuna push up and so the smaller ones take advantage of that early morning light and they generally blast out to the northeast sometime in the morning wherever you're fishing it's usually to the northeast that they move regardless of tide and it's because of the light they put that sun that's to the east and the south of them off their tails and they just go and they eat. And so I find myself getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And by then you have no choice but to continue to follow those small fish throughout that tidal cycle. And they're, they're thigmotropic animals, so they're gonna turn around. They're always return to the same point at any given day. They travel in circles their entire lives. They don't straight lines. So even though it may look like the tuna are moving from one area or another, they're doing it in circles. Hmm. So it's kind of fascinating. I've tried to actually like get on paper and like sort of like graph like using the the the, the title charts from the canyons in and like looking at some of the tag data that molly lakovich has available through the large parasitic research um you can sort of see the movements of these fish and they're linear 
And so you see the tag returned out and it looks like this fish is swimming sort of in a straight line. But when you try to lay it down and, and see what the fish does, they cycle in and they cycle out. And so one thing I'm certain of is when you go to an area that you're catching bluefin, you're not targeting the same fish day in and day out. Those are fish that may cycle into that area every say third or fourth tide or third or fourth day, but they're not the same exact ones. They're, they're, it's a conveyor belt of fish that sort of come in and at any given point they're you know, congregated in one area heavily. And as they travel, they sort of travel not so much in unison, but they follow the same basic path because the bait dispersion in that lunar phase is similar as they come into those areas. And so they travel through and they spend maybe a tide or two and then they leave and then they may come back you know, later that week or they may just disappear. But that, it's sort of like how packages come in at certain times of the year. Around Christmas, you know, the, the, the line gets choked up in certain areas and then they have a backflow and they have their warehouse overflowing. And then at other times of the year when there's not a lot of gifting going on, like right during tax season, yeah. <laughs> the routes and the avenues are open. And that's sort of as I envision it, sort of like a conveyor belt of, of, of movement. And these fish come through, they cycle in and they cycle out. I don't know. It's just a conjecture. And, and, and one thing... Um you said to me earlier, we saw you at the boat ramp earlier this season when we were heading out, and uh, we were talking about how Cape Cod got the big influx of smaller bluefin. Yes, it New did. New Jersey didn't see it. They didn't see it. They didn't see it in Rhode Island. They didn't see it in New York. And, um, you know, there's no surprise to that. These fish do what they want when they want. But um, I think a lot of that early season stuff is dependent upon the April weather, April and early May. Um, it dictates sort of when these fish turn to the west. They can tolerate extremely cold temperatures. They can go down to the bottom. They have the thermal heater. Um, I've seen even small ones in some pretty cold water, 49, 50 degrees. Um, so you get those milder winters, and the, the thing is the bait isn't abundant. So, yeah, the water might be all right, but there's not a lot in our water near shore in the winter because the near shore water is colder. You know, the, the, the bays and the rivers get really cold. Uh, the bottom, the benthic layer, year round, it's about the same temperature. And then you have the different substrates of water as you get up past the thermocline and then the surface temperatures. Sea surface temperatures are vastly different from, from underneath. You get currents, all of that stuff. But that's, I think, what brings those, those, those bluefin in. I mean, again, it's all conjecture. I don't so know. When the temperature gets right, it's where they in. And then you said they just start to paddle west. Where they yeah. in, they start to just paddle in. And they usually come in through one of three main areas, the South Channel, the North Channel, or they come in from the Far Eastern Canyons. When they come in from those Far Eastern Canyons, a lot of times Canada will see, you know, fish before even we will. And that happened this year. It was a northern arrival. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. And that's why New Jersey and New York got left they didn't, off. They didn't, I think they didn't so much get left off that those fish that had an affinity for that area, um, the smaller ones typically, I think, get brought away. The other year classes that start to show up, that main body is hanging together. You have all the different year classes. Some of those older fish look to move north into the colder waters where there's more abundant bait. And I have a feeling that those fish were up congregated in the canyons, out off the edge, you know, however many miles in that eastern Gulf Stream area. Um, I think they're all to the north and to the east this year, which is why they came in and we had all those. I mean, when it's small fish, I had some, some, some thir high 30 inch uh, releases. I, I, I harvested a couple 41, 42 inch fish. We saw a ton of 52 and 53. We're still seeing that size, but I also had some mid 60s. Um, that day I saw you and, and Chris in the parking lot there. I went up and you guys, Went right when you should have went left. We won't talk about Let's that. Let's not talk but, about um, that day. <laughs> I had that, that trip where in the same, out of the same feed, we got a 65-inch fish and a 44-inch fish out of the same exact feed. And that's a, that's a great mix of sizes there. Awesome. I, because what was scary, um, not scary, but I remember some guys were concerned 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when they said it's all this one size of fish and there wasn't a, a great spread of size. The missing year class is that right. weird slot limit year that we had. Oh, yeah. Um, it's the whole belief that we have any understanding of where this fish is or where it goes and what it does. Thankfully, the distances that they travel and the waters that they inhabit um, are places where just we don't go. It's just too far from shore. The expenses are too great. The ability to catch them, harvest them, and handle them isn't there. You know, they go across the Mid-Atlantic Trench. They're in the Sargasso. They're in the Med. They're seeing them up again in Europe. They're seeing them off Africa again. The species has rebounded quite a bit. That, that was going to be one of my questions for you. Is after doing this, how do you, th you think this uh, oh, the species is in a good place right I now? I think it's in a great place right now. I think it was never really in truly the, the dire straits that they thought it was. Was it depleted? Yes. We depleted tons of species. We 
we, we still harvest the oceans like it's we're, we're good at that on depletable resource and it's not we stopped gathering twigs and berries a long time ago and moved to commercial farming we don't take vast herds of antelope and zebra to feed the masses anymore it's all commercially raised livestock um, we're getting into aquaculture now but there's still an awful lot of nations going out and, and using really destructive practices um, that's for another story that's tragedy the common stuff that's uh, you guys gonna have to dig in deep and pay me for that guys. <laughs> <laughs> but the in, overall bluefin Fisheries looking good. I mean, the science says it's, it's doing the really well. The science says it's doing very well. You know, there was a time there for a year or so, the Monterey Seafood Watch List had it as sustainable and a good choice. And I think, yeah, you know, I'll leave why it occurred, but now it's back on the orange color not to, and i think it's just that in itself is, is a travesty. It's a, it's a fish that swims in our waters. We're, we're really um, good at conservation we as and i say we canada and the united states we fish under different commercial limits than the rest of the world we use 73 inches and over before we harvest our fish the rest of the world fishes at 47 inches and so icat gives us our quota the quota is broken down into the to, to the different hand gears the person uh, is gone we've twilighted that finally that's that's something that was good for the fishery when did that that was still hanging just on just recently ago, yeah. it was um you know in the, in the last four or five years the twilight began and it was through all of the new restructuring under the amendment systems um you had amendment 7 and amendment 13 both around over the last 10 to 15 years and both of them have helped um in some respects Magnuson Act originally, the wording on it was exploiting to its fullest the fishery. And then that exploitation kind of was a bad connotation, a bad term, became the conservation and they've come full circle. But we as, as, as a Western fleet and the way we harvested bluefin in combination with a geopolitical event, Gaddafi and Libya and, and that whole, uh, you know, blockade of, of, of Tripoli Harbor and the, the four or five years of just destroying those fishing boats as they tried to leave the blockade, the French and the English, I don't know how many they sunk, but then Gaddafi, you know, got out of power. And I think that right there got rid of the majority of the unregulated and unreported catch that was the lion's share of why we saw that depletion from 96 through like the mid 2000s. If you look at it, to me, it's not a coincidence that it sort of mirrors his rise to power and their acts by sea in combination with Libya, Turkey, and some of the Spanish boats doing the things they did with the, the tuna mafia and, and landing all that. that the, the EU, there's a few EU nations involved as well. You, you gotta have some place to sell it. But um, getting rid of those fishing boats, don't discount that. I'm, I'll go down on record. That's something I firmly believe in. And I think it's proof positive in the numbers that we have. The yeah. intermingling, they never understood it. It happens in mass events it happens in smaller events every single year these fish swim they tail across we get eastern mediterranean stock they get western stock and then we'll find out with all these studies of dna dr walker is doing a dna uh sort of like a family tree mapping of the of the population of the western atlantic bluefin and i'm hoping that he's going to be able to determine um lineal um, genes that go through so that you can find parental connections to these fish and we'll see if they interbreed as well That'd be very cool, man. Yeah. And you said you caught, in one in a single season, you caught six fish that were tagged across the Atlantic. In the same event in Europe. Well, it was uh, the Gibraltar. It was part of the GBPY year, which was this big tagging thing done through ICAT. Um, it was cooperative through the Tagatiny um, with Molly Lakovich and through the NOAA fisheries. And um, it was a sharing of, of information. One of the first times they shared a ton of that with the archival tags, some of the fish were tagged multiple times and during the same event. My, well, two of mine had two tags, wow. a pink and a yellow. Um, the other four had just the yellow spaghetti tag. Um, so they even put radio transmitters on some of those fish when they let them go. And it was all done over the course of like a week, I think, in, in, in it was net, they were netted. And then the, you know, the divers went in and they, they individually released these fish with the tags. So it was a very successful tagging event. I caught two down off the dump in July that year. Um, there were a few other people that caught them as well. You guys actually, I think, even might have written a little bit of blurb about it. Um, I caught the next two down in the channel, um, you know, east of Nantucket in um, August. And then the last two I caught up in September, east of Stellwagen. So. And, and from the point they had tags um, put in them and they were set free to the point that you, you would caught Lots these Lots of years at Liberty. I believe that event was 2016 or 17. I think I caught those fish in 19 or 20. Wow. 
Um, might be off a little on the yeah, year. Sure. It's all blurs day at this point, not only in my season, but you know, at this point in my career without going back through my log books, a lot of it's there, but very difficult to pinpoint exactly yeah. when it was. Um, some recent um, published research has determined that they believe that there's, you know, breeding up in, you know, our waters for the first well, time. Well, the slope sea for sure. I mean, it's kind of crazy for me to think that these scientists, um, without really, you know, getting enough empirical data, stuff that's uh, hands-on, it's all analytical. And so they take the information that's given to them and they disseminate it and they come up with their theories. And they truly are theories, almost all of this stuff with, with ichthology and, and conservation methods and responsible um, yields. Maximum sustainable yield is one of the things that they use. So trying to determine what's safe to harvest, what's not, what that animal does, um, what each animal does throughout the, the food chain in each ecosystem, um, all that is done, I think, a little bit vague, if you will, in terms of we, there should be a little bit more hands-on stuff. And that hands-on stuff um, comes in with some logic, too. There's some logical flaws, I think, in, in the bluefin science. Um, Barbara Block had uh, you know the leading research out on basically the life cycle of Western Atlantic bluefin. And it was for a long time held that Western Atlantic spawned at some time between the age of 10 or 12. Meanwhile, the Eastern European studies proved that those fish over there, three to five. And so it's a big difference, kind of like logically speaking, like that should have been addressed and like and, and, and viewed like it didn't really make much sense logically. Never mind. And then the other thing is, like, how could you put a, a pen or a box around the entire Atlantic Ocean and try to determine that there's one specific area that these fish paddle to to do their spawn? Are they going to clutch their eggs for an entire season because they happen to be in the northern Med and they're a Gulf of Mexico spawned fish? No, there's got to be places all over the globe where bluefin tuna, and with the right amounts of salinity, current, sunlight, temperature, they're going to do their thing. They just thing. need the conditions to be the right. Conditions and they could be anywhere. Right. Because I think it could be anywhere, they could truthfully. Because be, they move, they Is cover the, such vast distances right. over the span of How could of it not? Life? They've yeah. shown with the tag studies on some of those giants that they tagged up in, in Canada and some of the stuff we've tagged here with the actual radios, the satellite tags. So These fish don't come back to the same spot. Yeah. from year to year there was one fish like that was the one that they talked about it was the craziest it was like an eight it reported for a long time after the three year to five year lifespan was supposed to and this fish never went back to the same place ever in one year really that's so you know <laughs> swam up in the north sea went to iceland one year down the azorian trench was off tenerife in africa one year like up in the canyons down off florida in the that's gulf crazy. Like, that's they can go where they want, man. Yeah. I mean, like they, you said, they are an apex say. predator. They, they are so. an apex predator, but they're one of the few animals um, that can inhabit five feet of water comfortably as well as the vast abyss that is the bottom of the ocean. Um, so they have that going for them. There's a lot of room to hide. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, those slope, uh, slope sea studies, they, they were doing plankton uh, studies, plankton right? Plankton studies, well, they were also there directing Molly. You know, she's probably really upset. This was exactly what Molly spent a lot of her career trying to prove and did. And now, you know, I'm seeing some, some blurbs and bits and pieces, but they're by a completely different study. I believe it's out of URI. Hmm. Um, it's, you know, Molly, you know, interacted with these fish more than anyone. Yeah. If you really want to get down oh, yeah, to it. The Tagatani program has got to be 15, she, she's, years old. She's, she's got it worse than me, I would imagine. I've, <laughs> I've spoken with her just a couple times on the phone. I've had interactions with her. I've sat and listened to some of her lectures. Um, I know she's those fish are in her like they are in me. Um, and she spent her entire career studying these fish. And one of the few scientists, I think, that went where she was supposed to, which was out in the field. She was always on a boat. She did a ton of tagging studies um, down off Chatham with Eric Stewart back in the day. Um, and you look at that time frame, that was the heyday of our fish. That was that 2002, 2003 year class. And she like really got a lot of time in on those fish on boats. Um, she did a ton of tissue samples with the heads and the ear bones. She, she immersed herself in these fish. And she's been saying this all along. It's, we're fools to think that this amazing animal is, is, is boxed into that yeah, needs that to go human, to the Gulf of Mexico yeah, the need for the humans to put everything inside that box and understand it and let's face it these fish are, are, are fooling us and showing us and proving things on a daily basis myself included they do stuff every day that just you blows leave your the water it blows your mind and you say the more I do this the more questions I have and the less yeah. answers keeps it interesting man yeah. every day 
It's every day is different. That's awesome. Um, I, I I don't think we touched on this. I wanted to kind of circle back to it. Um, you know, with the with the clear designation of like from this size down as a wreck fish, from this size up as a commercial fish. What is an effective way to gauge the size of a fish safely? His tail, for us, um, most of the guys I know that look at him, the tail spread on that fish, when you get it to where it's supposed to be and the fish is a little bit tired, basically the, 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 the shoulders on, on, on an average man are about, say, 18 to 20 inches or so mm-hmm. in spread. If it's outside your shoulders, more than likely it's a keeper giant. It's fish that shouldn't be harvested as a recreational one. Now, later in the fall, there's those... Of course, everything's magnified underwater, which makes it difficult. But truthfully, if you're approaching and targeting these fish and you're using the appropriate gear, those tweeners, as we call them, those ones that are borderline, those cusp fish, they're going to work you over so bad where at that point you need to take the time to see what it is before you grease it. Because when they get to be about 67, 68 inches or so, when they hit about that 170 pound class, they turn into a different animal, Mm -hmm. much like they do when they hit about 90 inches. Um, there's just different levels and, and those 90 inch fish, those 90 to like 102, 103 inch fish. I think those are the toughest of the bunch. Really? Um, yeah, they got it all. They still have small fish tactics. Um, they, they, they use their girth and their weight at that point. It's sort of like getting one of those Marines fresh out of Camp Lejeune, you know, 20 years old and he's just in his prime. Um, the bigger they get, the more tendency they have to do the same standard thing, which is run, use their weight, go down to the bottom, come up to the top, circle. They don't have that maneuverability or that will, I guess, to, to use it. They hold on to it a little bit more in their tank. They're a little bit more stubborn, whereas those, those, those fish are wild. And it starts at about 67, 68 inches, truthfully. I've seen a ton of that, where those 64, 65-inch class, like they're tough, but they're not one of those 68 or 69-inch fish. And as you get into that 70-inch class, you've got an understanding like okay there's something on the end of the line here that's like not your garden variety hundred pounder that i can just you know flip over the side of the boat with one guy on the gaff it's a fish that you know beats the hell out of you during the fight Mm -hmm. beats the hell out of you during the end game and then it's difficult to get over the side you need two guys two gaffs sometimes three maybe another boat call right (laughs) right and so when you're when you're targeting them i think it's that tail spread like but more importantly it's just like using your head and if you're not doing it completely wrong you have a, at least a general understanding of fish and like you know what they're doing and how they're doing. You you should know when you're tied to a bigger animal. And it's, yeah. again, it's drag. If you don't know, your drag's wrong. Your drag will indicate immediately how heavy that fish is and what it does to the class rod you're using. Even the lake gear, it bends, but it bends a different way, and the fish act and do different things. While we were out fishing with you, we we had hooked one fish. I think it was actually the fish that you hooked, um, and probably a hundred inch fish. Um, that was the biggest one of the trip. And at one point you lit up and exclaimed, Oh, she's been hooked before with yep. like this, like child exuberance. That was Respect like, is like what was. you knew that that fish had been hooked before because as you call it, she pulled the crazy Ivan immediately. <laughs> she did everything though. And that fish was extremely good at doing everything it needed to at the right time. It made my job a lot harder that one the first one was a lot more predictable it didn't do as much Mm -hmm. things it sort of um got even more predictable later in the fight which is why we were able to put that one to leader i think three or four times and you know if it wasn't for the fact that it chafed us that one we probably would have lip gaff that bigger one i think you got a good look at the size of it when the drone in combination with you going and pissing her off with the the stick (laughs) <laughs> sticking a GoPro right in her face. Oh, yeah. You can, see, you can see that GoPro come down. And um, if you look at the video on where the sun is, I had said I didn't want to get near her. I didn't want her swimming under the boat, number one, but I didn't want to put my shadow. I didn't want to put the shadow of the boat because that shadow gives her a, a, a spot for cover. They immediately are going to seek that when you give it to them. Really? Yeah. Yeah, they'll get down and they'll get on those fish, especially if they've been hooked before. Not only that, they figure out the difference in pressure. They do that wide part of the circle and you think, oh my God, I almost have it. And you're looking at it as a captain and you're like, that thing's 40 yards away. It's going under my feet down at 80 to 100 feet in the water column. Like you're not anywhere near it. And the fish knows comes under the boat gets down and when it comes up high you're not anywhere near it so it's looking and it's trying to do what it's going to do to escape um and then pulling it in under the boat it knows that the boat is cover which means it goes under and it starts to rub up against things that break your line mm-hmm. 
uh, just an incredible species to to be enamored with and you know i cherish every day out chasing them and every experience with them but to to do that day in and day out has got to be one hell of a treat, Cap. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. I'm not going to lie. I mean, it's a great office. I, 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 there's nothing about those fish that's tiresome to me. I never get bored of them. Um, it's the, the my body. I've, I've crushed my, my body. I leave a little piece of my soul out there most days on these fish. <laughs> there's a lot of highs and lows that come with it. But um, mm-hmm. for me, it's, um, you know, tide and time. And there's just only so many tides and only so much time you can spend as a fisherman. So unfortunately, or to the fortunate benefit of a lot of other species, like nothing else matters for me anymore, really. I just, I don't want to fish for anything else. I do my tog because I just, I'll never stop togging. I do love my fall togging events. It's a good busman's holiday for me, but come spring, I just don't move until those bluefin show. I used to do some other stuff and I just, now I just sit and I just wait on them. What's uh, what's your indication that it's time to go? Time to get started with Typically the uh, Typically I spring. smell them first, I'm not going to lie. You know they're probably tailing around out there and I always go shake the boat down and do some spring sea bass. I like to go grocery shopping. <laughs> um, and it's what it is for me. It's grocery shopping. It's fun for about the first eight minutes and then it's all a matter of, as many people in my boat have been told, you're just five more fish, shut up. <laughs> and put them in the boat. <laughs> um, so I do those spring you know, grocery shopping trips and I'm down in Buzzards Bay or I'm up here um, you know, off in the sound and you'll catch a whiff of them i swear to god you'll get that southwest and they have the most unmistakable smell oh they stink on earth they the stink pheromones that they give off when they're moving through an area never mind when they're feeding it's an it's unmistakable it's heavy and it's permeating and when you've grown to really like seek that smell out when it touches you it hmm. oh it moves <laughs> <laughs> and then some and then yes. you move and then that's when the season begins but I'm not gonna lie it's the smell coupled with it's just I know they're out there I know they're there in April I know they're there in May I've encountered them it's difficult but they're there this year I went down and found them I had the day of all days and we were in them for two or three hours and I got one to respond there was no birds over them there was tons of them they were down south near Cox's and they were gone three days later and then they didn't return and it took, you know, a lot for me to like put the boat away all the way through the third week of June. When, and it got to the point where in my career, I used to pride myself. I used to go out, I used to be the first guy. I always used to love trying to be the first guy. There's a few other guys out there that did it, but you had to spend a lot of money and you had to have clients that were willing to just pay your fee. And I did those, I did I called them scouting trips. And I took, you know, a nominal fee in relation to like what I spent both with time, gas, and then, you know, the wear and tear on the on the on the, on the body and the, and, the, and the engines, the depreciating assets that I work with on both sides, um, that was you know a great thing to go hunt them down. And it's, that's what you do: you hunt bluefin tuna, yeah. and then you fish for them. But hunting them down, I get off on that. I still do. Finding them is really what brings me back. The hunter in me. It, it, it touches that that innate thing that society beats out of you when you're a kid so that you don't end up on the 11 o'clock news. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, oh, yeah, it's perfect. It's, it's so uh, true. It's, 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 it's that, 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 that sense that you get. Um, a lot of hunters talk about that. It's you primal. Just, it's, it's, it's primal. Yeah. It's, and it's an visceral experience every oh. time you go out on that water to begin with. Um, so for me, it, it's, it's really truthfully just knowing that they're always there, but it's that first whiff. It's, yeah. but the, the feeling you're talking about, like that's when I felt on the, on your boat, when you kill the engines and all you hear are whales blowing birds, sh- you know, the birds, uh, shrieking. And then all of a sudden it's like, there's one They're they're on the drop, drop, drop now. You know, that is just, oh. you hear that, you know, that excitement in my voice, it, it, it's because of you, you, the, the, the knowing that you have very short window of opportunity with these fish and knowing that they're right there and waiting. There was another point throughout the trip when you walk through all that crazy footage. Cause I gotta say like for me, um, I was psyched to have you guys on the boat because I run with no mate and I have shied away for many years now from giving anything away in terms of entertainment. I'm not here to, to be, you know, a Roman gladiator. I'm not here to entertain you. Um, I didn't want to give people, you know, tickets to my show without them paying for the live version, you know. Um, and so I got away from it. I did one seminar for Damon um, a few years back and I just basically went into the basic rigging. I didn't get into much. Um, I kind of am old school in that, that I feel like a lot of this stuff should be kept a little bit closer to the chest. It should be earned. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, 
Thanks for allowing us to earn that. Yeah. I mean, we've, how long have we known I've each other? A long time, time, you know? You guys have asked, and, you know, I kind of hesitated to do it, and I needed the right time. And the right, But truthfully, I wanted to highlight my ability to find those bigger ones and then tangle with them successfully. That was cool, but I, I didn't want to give away too much of, of, of the hunt, and I didn't want to give too much away. The rigging I have no problem with because it's for any, everybody's it's benefit. It's for the benefit of the fish. Um, so, you know, getting into that rigging, I did. I bring, I brought in a setup yeah. um, you guys had, had used. Do that. And, um, we can do that after. But for me, everything about that show was it, was, it was a culmination of knowing the time, the right time, getting it to work out with the scheduling, mm -hmm. and then feeling super confident with the conditions that you guys are gonna be able to grab. Sort of that footage that's in my brain. I have tons of those. It's so burned but in I've there. I never had a film crew on board during one of those big fish events where I'm confident that, yeah, not only are we gonna hook one, but I think I can show it to you. Thank you. Um, so I'm super psyched that that was Thank able you. to happen. I think, you know, and, and that, that second fish did like, that was a showboat. I mean, she stayed on the surface. We got the drone over. Oh, and, like, oh, oh. Oh. Well, like, going back through the footage, I was accurate in my assessment on that fish. Like, I think, you know, I could probably talk to Marky Brochu, who's a good buddy of mine. Um, one of the spotter pilots, one of the best. Um, he's really good at judging size as are most of those pilots from the air. And so I, I haven't shown this to him yet, but I'm interested on his take. I'm just going to give yeah, it to him blind sure. and say how big cap. Um, and I want to hear his take on it, but I think my assessment, you guys know what that assessment was. Yeah. I, I think anybody that sees that is going to be okay with, with my, with my <laughs> estimation on that because that fish was just too big. I got the leader, I took a few wraps, and then you saw the tide take that fish onto the bar, and it was just a Herculean effort just to get it, as you know, and then when, it, when I had to go around... Oh, you had to go around the motor, man. That was and it just, what happened was there's just not enough stretch and the full weight of that animal felt just that little bit of tension release because I had the one wrap and I had to like let it go to it to stretch the line back out and she then changed direction in her circle and went to go back up tide and that's when she came taut. Yeah. I would have really loved to have gotten a lip gaff in her um, and, and get a real good at and I wanted a tag in that one real bad. Yeah, that, that, that would have been in incredible. I did tag one um, two days before you guys got yeah. here. I showed you the pictures on that one. She was 90. We got her up. I measured her, like, straight length. I think she was probably a little bit fatter, so somewhere between 97 inches and 100 wow. inches. And See, got that one to, to swim, got the gaff in her, got the tag in a great spot, and then watched her kick away. So. To, to me, man, the, the actual size is secondary to just laying eyes on it. You know, I don't need to know how how big it was exactly. Like, I can look at it and I can think. It, it, you, you look at it, it's just it's amazing that The, the, the one where the drone this, flew so. over and you went, you know, we were at that point knowing I was attempting the lip gaff. I had let you guys know that I don't think she's quite ready, but here's a good opportunity. Yeah. We're going to go up and take a look at her. Um, when you came in, she was tailing away and she was trying to pull and she was pulling the rod the reel the boat cheech the boat when she felt the presence of the boat you noticed that there was that water show when she turned back into the current before she was able to get her tail in the water um that's when you get a good real good look at the width and the girth on the head and the length in relation to the bow so i mean it's pretty fantastic that we did that with both fish the, the, the one previous yeah. to that that one you did it then and then we did it one more time and so if it was an open season oh, oh, just a dang. week before <laughs> each one of those fish five or six just times a week over before you, you know we could have graced the decks with it but um you know that is what it is and 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 you know knowing that i think it was a better show because we had to get the footage without the proof yeah. you know you didn't have the the, the pudding at the end of the meal, <laughs> you eat your figgy pudding. It didn't happen, mommy. Um, but other than that, it's kind of—it's it, kind of you know—it changes a lot when you can't harvest that fish, and you know, as an angler that is just trying to survive it, right? I get it's Jimmy a lot and I, harder to release a fish, a which harder, is contrary to how so you'd think. It's so much harder you know, to, to release one than it is for me to put the advantage back in our court and grease one with the harpoon. Yeah. Yeah. I, think I we dig throwing minutes. that thing, too. I mean, I dig throwing yeah. the harpoon. I, I really enjoy the it's whole the aspect of it. Um, since the beginning of time, the most efficient way to dispatch an animal larger than you has been with a large pointy stick. Yeah. <laughs> and so some of the materials have changed. Yeah. You know, you got the detachable head and you got the, you know, the new dining the line which cuts it through but let's face it at the end of the day that's a big pointy stick and so you know being able to get in near one and use that which you're allowed to do it, it shortens the advantage that they have and it shortens the time yeah. you, know, you can you can enter the game sooner sometimes way sooner if the fish makes a mistake and you're rigged and ready yeah you can end the fight yeah end game and so that that whole end game process becomes ultimately longer the longer you fight it 
the more improper your drag setting is, the longer you let that fish rest between bouts, the longer you take time to get that fish nearer, the harder it becomes. It's, yeah. it's exponential the longer the fight and then the, the lighter the gear. I mean, we, we were probably on the biggest one for 90 inches, and I think somewhere in that 45 to 50 minute range, we had our first primo dart shot. One hour is my, everybody knows this expression from me, it's pop it or stop it. Yep. And everything goes wrong after an hour. I, I, I truly feel that I'm more efficient by doing the things that I need to do and using the tools. I think you can get better leverage on these fish in combination with the boat and lighter gear than you can from a static, say, down east that's it's relegated to go in reverse. The fish feels your weight and feels your power. You don't have the maneuverability. You don't have the ability to counter that run that the fish does. You gotta wait it out and pull it back. Yeah. Whereas in a light tackle situation, not only is the angler movable from side to side from the bow, and then you know, I see guys, which is the wrong way to do it again, doing the <laughs> rings around the boat, the rings around the boat, but you can do that in a center con. So you can't do that in a walk around yeah. or, or, or a, certainly down east or a sport fish safely. Yeah. And so, I think some of our, our fight times are shorter, truthfully. Because mm -hmm. like, I've done both. I mean, I've done a ton of, 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 of large tackle commercially, and I've done some, some stand-up over the last few seasons, and I noticed just a difference in that. The stand-up fights, I think, are just a little bit quicker if you're allowed to end them. Yeah. It yeah. flips to the other side, and the other court gets the advantage when you have to release them. And that's then, and we just you want that bent butt, unlimited class rod that's nine feet long, and that big winch... Mm -hmm. That 80 wide or that 130, you know, maxed out on the drag and the gunnel to take all of the abuse. Yeah, it's the boat and the gunnel doing all the lifting for you, not the angler. And that's As you guys saw, that. there's not the ability yeah. to use a belt. A lot of people have asked me, why don't you use a belt? Number one, the reels I use don't have harness lungs. Number two, we do not fight the fish with the reel. We lift the fish with our bodies in the rod and we gain line. And that's the difference. You can gain line in a conventional system out of the gunnel and a swivel rod holder. You can use your pull arm and you can pull the line in conjunction with moving that lever. And it's more like a mechanical system. It's, it's a fulcrum and, it, and, it, and it's a mechanical advantage that you gain using that overhead. When you have to lift that rod yourself because it's maxed out, you then become that fulcrum. And you know the, the, the winch doesn't exist. You have to do everything with your body get that rod up and then reel down without the tension in unison. So it's that technique. That's why I'm, I'm still, still bruised, feeling, yeah. <laughs> and bruised and <laughs> sore. It, Honestly, going in, that was my biggest fear. I know what you do. I've seen it. We've talked for years and it was like my biggest concern going in. Jimmy shared it with us. Is like, are we going to hold up? Well, you, you, spent some time, you guys spent some time, you know, on the smaller fish, Jim, I had you with the light tackle. And, and one of the eyeball openers for you was that very first chip you did with me where I talked about the triangle. And then you went out with um, my, 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 my second captain I had working for me, Jogo. Um, you saw it again there. Real and piece you did, on you that. Article about the 45 degree. And so it's, it's technique in combination with um, sort of conserving your energy. At the same time, you're conserving yours. You're trying to deplete him. Like, like I cool. noticed just on this past trip with the first fish, I went into it probably a little bit overexcited and I burnt myself out fast. I thought my forearm was going to explode. Yeah. And then the second fish where I kind of slowed down and Got was in like your happy focused place. more. I talked about getting in your happy place. Mm -hmm. Getting in your happy place is understanding um, the rod lift, going low enough to the water and rocking backwards without using your arms. And it's that ability to do those short little lifts um, something I don't mind, you know, that's angler yep. related. That's not captain related. That's nothing that I do. That's something that every angler should try to achieve, whether it be with the spin rod or the short rod or the long rod. The, the, the better you are at gauging where the tip needs to go into the water and where that rod's going to load up for you without going too high. Going too high. What you do then is you start wasting energy and mm -hmm. you start coming up too high and you start burning in combination with your adrenaline and everything else. Um, and the fact that the fish is fighting for his life and you're fighting for basic glory. Um, that's where that sort of yeah. secondary, um, you know, the innate animal, that savage that's within us all, he can only do so much in a situation like this with these blue things. I've said some big dudes yeah. just crumble. And then you get these little guys on the boat and, you know. They, they have the technique in there. And they just... sit there on the rod and 45 minutes later, I mean, I've landed some huge fish with novice crews. I've also landed some huge fish with one and two man crews. I've lost some battles with 
I don't know. I had too many people on the on the fight at the end. I didn't have enough life jackets in, in, in a couple of those fights because I'm just <laughs> borrowing bodies from other boats. And that stopped to some extent. Um, I still will lean on another guy that's got you know a fun time and fun anglers going, and if it can be done reasonably well, we used to be able to pass the rods off. We can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes I'll, I'll ask to borrow an angler if someone wants to just come and tug on one, and it's safe. We can do it that way. But you can't pass the rod back and forth anymore. Um, so we used to do that. It used to be like the pitch. It was in the commercial world. You know, if you hooked up, you tripled up, you doubled up, you used to be able to do it. The new amendment also went into dealing with transfer at sea. And so it's at any point during the fight. So now with a you know rod attached to a bluefin in the water, you can no longer do that. But yeah, back in the day, it used to be just guys hanging off the T-top, people throwing up over the side from adrenaline, um, <laughs> you know, broken dreams, broken hearts, broken equipment. Um, We've gotten a lot better at, at, at doing it. At least I have. I know there's a few other guys that, uh, that still do it. But truthfully, there's not a lot of guys that dedicate it and don't pull out the trolling bar or don't pull out the big rod when things get a little bit slow. And I think that uh, anybody who owns a boat and chases these fish will realize, like, when you start to try to split hairs and you do different things, like, you just don't really quite approach them properly unless you make the right decision at the right time. That's tough to do. Um, go out with one goal in mind when it comes to bluefin and use one practice and approach. And that's something I've done to, uh, you know, add an awesome as opposed to add infinitum. <laughs> the On The Water podcast is brought to you by Guidesly. Hey, charter captains, are you tired of pouring all your money and time into all the stuff that comes with running a charter business other than the actual fishing? Guidesly gets it. That's why they created Guidesly. Guidesly is built for guides, and they understand and solve the unique challenges that you face every day. Let Guidesly handle your book of business from technology to customer management, leaving you to handle the fishing. Become a guide on Guidesly.com and download the Guidesly Pro app today. Focus on what you do best, putting customers on the fish, and leave the rest for Guidesly to handle. So, Dom, when we were out with you the other day, we were using a jig that you said you had a hand in designing, and that's the point you deep force. Can it's, you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's the, it's, it's the only jig you need, number one. But um, Joe Martins uh, and I, a real good friend of mine, uh, we spent a lot of time back in the day on my smaller uh, bay boat commercial fishing out of Rhode Island. Um, we did bass, we did scup, we did sea bass, um, all pin hooking off of a row marine that I used. And we spent a ton of time together on the water. And Joe ended up purchasing Point Udlers, the old Rhode Island company, the tin. So he had the tins, he had the butterfish tin, you had the original Pogey, you had the, the their diamond jig, which was, you know, a bridge port basically, um, but all tin lures. And um, Joe and I being friends in this tuna craze, you know, coming about where the jig started to come back into play, I was fishing deeper water and we needed something that could get down to the bottom for me. And so him being a lure manufacturer and already being in the tin business, it was a natural segue into two brains, you know, focused on, on two different aspects, but coming together using my sort of what I wanted and what I knew would work and, and Joe getting a, a, a lure into his arsenal that would work. Um, Captain Jack Sprangle had, had, a, had a hand in it in the finish and, and, and some of the, the finish work on it as well. So Jack, myself and, and Joe um, developed that jig for the deep water bite, uh, 180 feet to, to like 230, 240. Um, we needed something heavy that got down fast, that had good action, that could be put in the hands of relatively inexperienced anglers and still get bit. And so the, the deep force was born. And um, from the get go, um, you know, a lot of people shied away from it. Uh, a lot of people were hesitant to use it because of its simplicity. It's um, something that got hammered into me as a kid. My grandfather, um, the kiss rule. You know, he used to say, keep it simple because you're the last S in that equation. <laughs> and so we did that with that jig and we talked about getting it, you know, finished and getting the, like all the different colors that the fishermen wanted. And I was adamant that it was the, the silhouette. The ambient light down there is very little, let's face it. And that coupled in with what we touched on earlier with the color, I don't think that they see it. And so it's a reactionary strike. It's something that it triggers the lateral line. There's a little bit of flash necessitated. So it's got the flash but it's the profile and the way it falls and is retrieved that makes that point you so amazing. And it's literally the only jig I put in the water. I've, I've been approached, there's a lot of guys I have affiliations with, there's a lot of people that have sent their jigs to me and kindly thank you, but um, they're just gonna go and they're gonna be, you know, put off to the side and gather dust because that deep force is 
able to be dropped in any situation in the hands of anyone and the fish just tear it up. You guys got to witness that. I mean, I had to go meet Jeff, who's Joe's brother. Joe passed away um, a few years back, um, miss him. Every day I go out on that water, Joe's there on that boat. So that deep jig has a sentimental thing for me as well. Um, Ron Z is the other one. Uh, I got, I, Ron, Ron Poirier and Joe were also friends and this was all going on around the same time. Ron had already come out. Ron had spent a long time looking for that sand eel fall and Ronnie did his thing and Ronnie was the best. And he had a very profound effect upon me, not only as uh, an adult male, um, meeting a guy later in life, in other words. I was older when I met him and it had been a long time since anybody had come into my world um, in a sort of not like a fatherly way, but a mentorship type thing where he, you know, re reached out to me and, and, and introduced himself to me and said, you know, you got the same thing I got. You got the, you, you, and you got the stuff, too. So let's 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 get together. And um, so both of those two guys literally leave the dock with me every trip to this very day, because there's two things I do not leave with. And those are Ron Z's and those points you jigs. Um, and so that point, Jude, the way it's rigged, the way it came into my life and the importance to, the, to, to, to my success, um, why, why, why fiddle with something? Why go back to the drawing board? It's the same thing with my rigging system. Like once I found it to work and it's, it works beyond what it needs to, you don't go back and change. If it's not broke, you don't fix it. And um, as much as I'd like to say uh, I'm like cutting edge, I'm not, I'm actually old school. In, in, in my approach and, and, and I, I, I go about these fish methodically and, and, and in the same fashion, once you put the pieces together, that puzzle is always gonna be a puzzle each and every day, but you're a lot better at taking those pieces and making it at least visible with what's supposed to be there. It might not be all the pieces, but um, taking things like the point you jig out on board with me and taking things like the Ron Z, especially since my job's a lot harder than every other captain's with those fish, I'm fooling them solely on metal and, and, and plastic and, and rubber. I don't have the ability to put a whole spread out of, of trolling lures that have like 50 baits on each one with the splash bars and the squid bars. I don't troll ballyhoo. I don't put live bait in the water predominantly. Um, unless I'm giant fishing for you know stand-ups or commercial, and so that lure in combination with the Ron Z and then all my top water plugs, um, which let's face it, they're stick baits. They're all stick baits. They're hard body. They all require a little bit of motion. They all do the same thing. I hate to <laughs> throw those guys under the bus, but um, the jig is is, is more, the subsurface. These fish spend you know 98% of their lives subsurface. They come up and they show you a little glimpse sort of like a good looking girl in a bar, you know, you know, nice sundress, she'll give you a little bit of leg and maybe that bare shoulder might brush your hair back, but you're not mm -hmm. gonna get to touch. That's bluefin. And um, the best way to go about getting after them, I think, especially like what we talked about over the years and the, the, the changing of the bait and the style of fishing, um, going subsurface for them. Yeah, it, I mean, the puzzle the, the, uh, is always gonna have interchangeable pieces to it, but it, the more that you can flip to a constant piece, the better your chances of success And that constant piece is, is realizing be. that at any, on any given day, even when it's like the top water feed, I tell guys, there's a lot of fish that you're not seeing, and those bronzies and those point dudes stay in the water a lot longer. So they're fishing for you all the way to the bottom. Mm -hmm, yeah. You get several attempts to jig up off the bottom and return to the bottom, then you have the whole return trip where you're gonna get struck. And it's the same thing with the Ron Z. The Ron Z is even more uh, particular and peculiar in its nature that you can dead stick them. Yeah. Rodney the Rodney, Rodney's the best fisherman on the boat. You put that <laughs> Ron Z out, you let it fall three quarters of the way to the bottom, halfway to the bottom, whatever you choose, and you literally just put it in a rod holder, put it out at the bow, or put it up in the T-top so that it's out over everything. And as that lure drifts further away from the boat, it rises and falls with the rocking of the bun. I mean, you get stroked on that thing. So you have to have the Ron Z. And for me, I have to have the point two. I remember one of the first really, really big tuna taken on spin I heard of was I was working here and we put it in our uh, tails and scales section. You had like a 400 pounder. This is going back. Oh, that's at going least back. 10 years. Yeah, yeah, this is like 2010, I want to say, up on yeah. the bank. I remember that fish to this very day. It was the first 400 pounder on, on Lake Gear where someone had like, greased one and actually brought it back and weighed it. And that's, you know the distinction of our fishery and why I think our fishery is just better than all the other ones, not just because it's my backyard and it's, you know, our backyard. Um, I truly feel it's the one place on earth where you can tangle with these bigger fish, but you also have the ability 
to land them and let the fisherman's tails sort of wane with the scale tail. And that scale, the tail of the tape, unless you have that tail of the tape and you have photographic evidence and you actually come in and you weigh that fish, like you can call it whatever you want, but let's see it on the scale. Yeah. I think the East Coast fishery um, got a lot of poo-pooing back in the day. I myself was guilty of this. We were overestimating the size of these things. And the cow factor out on the West Coast, they had that designation of 200 pounds to cow, 300 pounds to super cow. Those headboats with the Pacific bluefin and the yellowfin, they land them all. So they bring them back and they weigh them all. Out here, when we first started, um, we were bringing them up the boat and we we're putting them on laps. And sometimes we were putting them on laps and then they had to go back in the water because you know, you're learning and feeling it out. They redefine that rule about HMS species, billfish, and, and tuna being left in the water as opposed to removed from the water for release. So all of that came and went, and that fish that you're talking about was like the first one that I hung on to, and I did it with a relatively inexperienced crew. One of the kids, uh, Rob, I think his name was, um, he had caught a bluefin before. The other two kids hadn't even caught a bluefin. And oh, we jigged up on a Ronzi up at the beginning of the season. It was in June, I want to say June 28th or 29th. It was one it was of the first fish start. of the season. It was one of the very first commercial fish of the season. And I did it amongst a couple of harpooners on like a foggy day with the whale boats watching. And it just was an epic battle. I got dragged out. Um, I lost my harpoon to the bottom. Another captain, a friend of mine, Billy Mages from Major Day, um, was in the vicinity. And I called them over and I was like, dude, I got this monster fish man and I, I need i need a harpoon so i got the harpoon on the boat and i darted it on a borrowed harpoon and that dart pulled and at that point all my clients were gas and we still had them on the rod and reel so i cleared that harpoon out of the way and then billy he had one of his buddies he was commercial fishing and had a couple friends he was able to get on board and harpoon the fish for me with me on the rod and it was one of those things where like, even he just turned, we both looked at each other like, holy shit. That's, That's a big one. one. It's a real <laughs> one. <laughs> and we got back to the dock and, um, you know, I, I did the right thing. I took the gill plate off. I got it and I gilled it and it, it came in at 401. Wow. So it was like a 450, 460 pound fish, give or take maybe with the bloods and the guts out. Those guts weigh a lot and they have a ton of blood, but it still had the head. So we weigh them here when they get dressed or field dressed. They're, they're not trunked and they're not, you know, like dressed in terms of for sale dress, but they're, they're, they're originally handled where you bleed them and you gut them unless you're in a tournament. And I didn't enter tournaments. And so I did. And when it hit 400, it was like, that's a legit fish. Um, I was floored. It was just, I was over the moon for it. I was still in disbelief. And then a couple weeks later, I, you know, hooked up with another one. And that one, you know, was near the same size and, and, and didn't quite make the 400 pound mark, but it was like likely lightning strikes twice. And then from that season on, it just like progressively each year, I started landing more and more of them. I got, I started landing some on the top waters. Um, I got that, I got two now and I would have thought it would have been the jig fish, you know, that the, 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 the Ron Z and, and, and it was on a long rod that Ron Z, but actually the biggest two that I've landed now are on surface plugs and those seven and a half foot rods with, with, with the egg beater, as they call wow. them, or the coffee grinder. Um, you know, Stella 18,000 with, with braided line on a seven and a half foot rod on a surface plug. And So your two biggest fish are on surface. I, I would have thought it would have been the jig too. I would have thought it would have been the other way around. I mean, I have a ton of them. I think I have more than most. I, I think I can confidently say that just because I have all the pictures and the, and, the, and the landing slips to prove it. And it's one of the few places on earth where we get to harvest them. Down in the Carolinas, they can target them, but when they have clients on board, they can't because of state law. So oh, a Peter Charter Headboat, it affords us to fish in both categories. And if it's the first fish of the day, my clients have the choice. I, as a captain, have the choice. Do I want to release this fish and remain and hope to get a small recreational fish? Or do I want to harvest said fish, which then puts us in the general category. That fish is then landed and transferred for sale through a licensed buyer. It's tagged. And that's where the weight factor comes in. And so yeah. I was able to prove, um, I was able to put that proof um, on paper and show people. This is the picture of the fish. Yes, it came back to the dock. Yes, okay, you might've catch one's long and you got one up to the boat and you, you, know, you released it, but you didn't bring it back and you didn't weigh it. So here, it, it's like that one place you can do it. And not only that, it's like the greatest place like to target them near shore on top of it for a longer season. You got North Carolina, they call it Tuna Town USA, maybe for yellowfin and big eye, but for bluefin, sorry guys, no way, no how. It's here, it's proven year after year after year on numerous methods. We get the bulk of the, of the commercial, they're down there for a shorter period of time. It's in the winter when it's uncomfortable to fish. So yeah, you wanna go catch bluefin tuna, you come to 
the Cape Cod, Southern New England area, and that's where you fish. There is no place else on earth. I'll take all comers. You can sit down, I'll put my cup here, $10, change my mind. <laughs> <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's the best place on earth to target bluefin tuna, especially on the light gear. And if you want to do big fish and you want to be able to land those big fish, it's the only place. You go to Canada, they get limited amount of fish they can harvest. It's done on the big gear because of the fighting regulations, the gear that can be put into play. Yeah, they're only, what is it, 45 minutes 45 or an minutes hour? 45 minutes to an hour, I don't know what it is now. It used to be that on um, one fish in the morning session, one fish in the afternoon session, and each boat only gets a handful of tags for the entire year. So it's all catch and release. It's done in a relatively similar playing field or arena up in Prince Edward Island. It's got a similar geographic um, sort of layout to Cape Cod Bay. It it's looks a lot that, like Cape Cod Bay. It looks a lot Bay. like Cape it's, Cod Bay. It's, it's got wild. that shallow water. It's got mackerel on one side. It's got herring on the other. It's got deep, rich waters for traveling in between. You have Nova Scotia. But those fish are all baited. They're typically baited near herring nets, and they use heavy leader and they leader them in by hand. And so the mate takes over and the mate takes advantage. Whereas here, we end those light tackle games with the ability to harvest them. Or like you guys experience, we actually have to, to, to fight them up, but you can come here and you can time it right, especially now with the, the, the seasons and the way they work with the sub quotas. You have monthly sub quotas and then you have days where it's restricted and days where it's open. And so if you book the right trip during the right time of year, as I proved to you guys, if we hadn't hit that quota, the, the one, of, one of those fish on Sunday was coming back. Yeah. <laughs> and you guys were getting that once in a lifetime ability to like, you know, touch the fish, hold the fish, get your picture taken, and then stand in the truck right underneath that scale that says this is how big this fish was. You get that here. You don't get that in a lot of places. What's left for you to accomplish? Is there anything, like, you're always trying to move that bar. What, what, what are your, what, what's your goals going for? What do you want to do? Truthfully, I, I really, I, I had one hooked up. I had some clients. We were down uh, in October, and I hooked one on a Ron Z, and this fish was impossibly large. It's indelibly etched. I, I have a basic couple pictures of the thing's tail from the limited ability of my gas clients to use my cell phone and get a picture of it. But I got a hold of her. And I pulled her by the leader, and um, I don't want to say it was a thousand pounds, but it was a bigger animal than I've ever encountered on the, in that close proximity on my own boat. And I have a couple of 800 and 900 pound fish under my belt on the big gear. This thing, it was, it's a fishtail. It's always going to remain a fishtail, but I know she's out there and I know I can do it. So I, I know it might sound nuts, but I've done one 700 plus pounds. I've had a couple others in that neighborhood. I brought those back to dock successfully. Before I quit, it'd be kind of cool to bring in one of those 110, 112, 115 inch fish. If I'm fortunate enough to hook one, it does the right stuff and it's open where I can harvest her. I mean, I'd love to do that, but at this point, I think I can safely sit back. There's a couple guys that might be doing this that I'm doing, but I think I can take a big deep breath, honestly. <laughs> and I think I can say I used to find him first I still think I find them often, maybe more often than others, maybe less often, but I find them often. And um, the numbers at the end of the season, there's, there's no denying that you know, my approach is, is successful. So I don't think anybody's gonna catch me for a while in terms of numbers. I got over 100 Giants documented all on the light gear over the last 12 seasons. And so somebody's gonna have to spend an awful lot of time doing only that and landing these. You know, I have several over 90. I have three that have all been brought back to the dock over 100 inches now on these, this lake gear. And I just did it twice with you guys in that same neighborhood. Um, yeah, you get, someone's gonna have to really put forth a Herculean effort. And so, yeah, I'll throw that gauntlet down and say, the answer to that is I, I wouldn't mind landing one bigger, but I don't feel like I need to. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, man. I love it. Um, 1496, is that ever gonna fall? I'm not sure. Yeah. You know, I, I, I know they're out there. I, 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 I've seen pictures of them. The pilots have taken pictures of them. I think guys have been hooked into them. I think that it's going to happen. I think that this crop of big fish that we've had, there's been a few guys that have been close here in Cape Cod. We've had yeah. a few over 1,300. Vasalo's fish back in the day, the Reverend Vasalo there, that thing was over 1,300. Colin Lundholm, young in his career, he already has one that was well over 11 or 12. There's been a few 1,200-pound fish, and so that's not far away. You know, the right diet and, 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 the, and the right guy. Here's the thing, though. Um, who's going to gaff it? <laughs> it's going to have to be gaffed if it's going to go in IGFA. And so 
I think somebody out there is sick enough to do it with, <laughs> with, 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 the, with the hand gaff and, and do it under IGF. That decreases the odds of time. It, it, it decreases it a lot because those fish are, you know, you want that thing dead and you're allowed to use a cockpit harpoon. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So someone's going to have to be dedicated to that IGFA. And I think there's a few sportsmen out there in the world now that are going to places. I know of a few myself. I've been contacted by a couple guys looking to do line class records. I think that's coming back around where you're seeing guys now want to go because they want to do that. The old tackle records are so far and few between that they want to get their names in the record books. So they're actually going after like the tip of classes in fly and they're going after the other line class records because those are a little bit more attainable. Yeah. So maybe someone's going to get it done. Um, but it's going to have to be gaffed. And so, yeah, I think maybe not in my lifetime, maybe in my lifetime, but that fish is out there. And I think that there's enough coconuts roaming the seas, just like me, that are absolutely just consumed by these animals that, yeah, that fish is out there. And I guarantee you there's somebody that's, you know, better than somebody else. There's always a bigger fish, (laughs) you know? And so there's always a bigger angler to go after that bigger fish. It's going to take big luck big pockets and, 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 and big dreams to, to get it done. But yeah, that one's definitely doable. I like the line class sound of things. That, that seems like uh, it'd be a fun, fun goal to throw out there. It's not. I can tell you from experience. Um, <laughs> fly fishing for bluefin tuna. No, I'm, I'm very, good with that. I'm good with very that. enjoyable. Um, that whole record and the way it fell. Um, yeah. Maybe I could use this opportunity to say I don't believe that one. The fly record on tuna. Yeah. I don't believe that for 15, almost 20 years, it was hovering between 92 and 94 pounds. And then all of a sudden it was crushed by 100 pounds. And it came out at like 192. There were no fish in between. And let's say yeah. that those guys sort of just faded off. And it's kind of like a Barry Bonds type thing where like, I'll go down saying like, maybe the record books show up. Maybe they did do it. Maybe these guys are going to see this and be like that. <laughs> but you lie, I swear to it comes yeah. to mind with that yeah. one. Maybe not. But um, I've done enough of myself in the 40 and 50 pound range. It's brutal. Oh, on fly. And yeah, and I had a guy come and try to break a couple line class records using Andy 20 and 30 pound line, and they're big fish, and it takes hours, and, and you can't touch yeah. it until everything's there. You can't end the game, so you yeah. have to do it all the way to the end, like we do it with the release. Um, you say it's like sounds like a lot of fun. It's not. I don't know why I'm yeah, it now that I'm processing what what, what that takes. It's that's just a different level of dedication to do something that's wasting a lot of time. When I worked at the tackle shop, there was a, we, we had a, a customer who would come in always looking to break line class records, and it was black drum for them. Like, spool up the reel with the six pound Andy, and one time the Andy broke over six pounds, and like it was like it wasn't our fault. It was a bad batch of the line, but uh, it just didn't seem fun. Like it's it's. The whole fun and Andy of tournament the, yeah. it has the most because they are truly the most to the line pounded to give you the best strength and they don't break over. But even the Andy tournament throughout the years has crushed a few souls when it comes back a half pound or a pound over the, t- the test rating and they broke yeah. the record. It's, it happens. Um, there's a lot of guys, you know, that end their pursuit unsuccessfully with that as well. And I, I mean, Fools I stopped are. playing basketball when I was like 13 years old because I can't jump and I can't shoot. I mean, <laughs> typically you know, I got human nature involved there. I like to do things that I'm successful with. Yeah. You know, and, and truthfully fishing, I, I don't know, I can't think of too many other things. Golf maybe, sex. You can, really, you, know, you can do it an awful lot. You can be not good at it and you can enjoy it, but there are too many other things that you can pursue where you fail a lot that are still fun. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> that's a great yeah, point. I went there. I that's went there. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a good note to end on. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Captain Dom, always a pleasure. Love, love spending time with you, whether it's on your boat or in situations like this. And, and just thanks for having us, well, man. Well, thanks for you know bringing me in, and thanks for making it uh, uh, an environment that I you know I've been shying away from it, like I said. And this was a comfortable setting. I, I was happy to talk about you know what makes my life so amazing to me in that what I get to go and do, it's like church every day for me. It's as close as I get to church, actually. You get to interact, I can see all the sunrises, I see some of the sunsets. Um, you see things and you, and you experience things. And so, you know, I got to couple it by getting out to come and talk about it and giving everybody maybe a little bit of like background into, you know, what it is to be a glamorous Cape Cod bluefin tuna jack, you know, captain. Um, so I also had a great time with you guys on board. It was uh, it was a lot of fun that day. It really was. Oh, dude, it's a good time. And, and I, I don't mind I don't mind the uh, the tough love on the boat. Like, it's I, I'm good with that. A little yelling it's at It's cool. You didn't, get, yeah. you, know, you didn't get yelled at, Joe. No, Cheech did. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 nobody got yelled I at. I got Cheech because I kept yelled, yelled, You get yelled towards. There's a difference. Yeah, yeah. I never yell at anyone. I yell towards them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's instructive. But, but where it comes from, 
Nobody, Nobody wants, wants to fish, fish more to the boat, boat more than you do. Correct. I want to fish more to the boat, but I, I try to explain to the guys my exuberance and my passion. I'm Italian, so I'm, I'm a little bit loud and boisterous to begin with. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like off kilter. I'm, I'm a little weird. I'm a little strange. I'm a little nuts. A little all that combined. But the coach mentality comes, and, and, and the thing that comes to mind for me is my my my. Everybody's high school football coach. Yes. Where they're high school, they're that, they're doing the suicides. You hated that guy. I mean, you hated him, but you loved him. Mm -hmm. And you hated him during those times, and you hated him when he grabbed you by the face mask or, you know, go run laps, you know, and, and, and you, you're doing it, and you're saying, why am I doing it? There's a particular reason why I do things a certain way. But it's the safety factor. Those animals are huge, and we're out offshore in a boat, and if you get cut or wounded or you go overboard, like, bad things can happen. So that's involved, much like contact sports, and you're the guy responsible. But you also got to be able to take the talent that's on your boat and you got to be able to guide them into doing things for you. And so it's a motivational thing for me. And being the quiet guy never worked for me. Being the quiet guy never worked for me. I grew up in a big Italian household. We had to speak up to get what you wanted. Um, I played sports with, with guys that were aggressive and, and loved to play. And, and, and I partied with people and the same thing. So I've done all of those things in those arenas and they all kind of remind me of bluefin tuna fishing <laughs> in combination with going to the circus as a kid and then the, and the, and the, and the anticipation of the cotton candy and then and the, and the, and the things you're going to see. Um, and then the big animals. All the big yeah. animals are right. It's like a circus. But you have to have the guy um, at the circus as well that is the ringleader. And so, uh, you know, the captain of the boat is, is, is responsible for his charges and he's responsible for the success of the fishing day. So it's the guide in combination with the, the captain. And, um, I like to, to, to control things. Yeah. So you get aboard by boat, um, yeah, you might hear me, I might have a reputation for, for barking and yelling, it, but it's to be heard and it's to make people do things that they didn't know they could do. That's, I mean, I, I mean, felt, felt myself, myself kind of lagging and all of a sudden all I hear is, real now, real now, real now. And then you got me go, Lift real. And it's, it's it's like you pull it up. Yeah. Some guys, and I do have clients that tell me to shut the Oh, dumb. You know, they really do. And, and, and those are the guys I can lean back with, whether it be personal experience or just them not caring enough. And so I don't have to care enough. Like, let's just let them have that. And I have clients that come that I don't say anything. And it's a different experience for me, but it's what they want. It's what they paid for. And so there's a few dudes that have come by my board that have done some, some good things without me in the background. But to a T, especially on those big fish. Most people crumble and falter and fall, and they need that motivation. And that coach in your ear, even as a professional athlete, I mean, you look at coaches and what they're paid today, they get paid more than some of the players in, in, in some respects. And it's because they're able to take all that talent that they have, and they're able to focus that talent and to enact a game plan. You know, you, you need to have somebody who's going to take the point. And, and, and in my case, I got to take point, rear, and you know, be responsible for the field dressage and, and, and everything else in between, the supplies, the, the electrolytes going into your body. Sit down, take, take a breath, breath, take a Gatorade. The, the, the football coach analogy is perfect. It really is. It's like if you played football, you, you, every, no matter who your coach was, they left you with something that you've carried with you for the, your entire life. Absolutely. A good and grandfather, a crazy uncle, um, you know, a good teacher maybe in yeah. your life. They all had that ability to, like, pull you aside and shake some sense into you. And without you never want to let that guy down. Right. You know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's the best fish in So hopefully I give that persona, you know, to, to my people. I, I think they all know, like, you know, it's, it's, for me, it's all good natured. I do like to have fun I, I bust a lot of nuggets on my boat there's an awful lot of ribbing that takes place i mean that's that's what it's about coming yep. together the camaraderie and all that so sorry for all of you i've yelled out but not sorry <laughs> it's a super fun <laughs> environment and uh, I, I wish i could do it every day so thanks thanks again for uh for for coming on and having us on your boat and i'm psyched to see the footage can't that's wait gonna be a pretty epic uh shot yeah you know and I, I think that the whole yeah, stay tuned, guys. Anglers, uh, angling Adventures next season. It's going to drop sometime late January, early February in that range, and uh, it's going to be a great one. And if you want to find Dom, CoastalCharterSportFishing.com. Yes, you can and find me on Instagram, Coastal Charter Sport Fishing. Same on Facebook, although um, these days, you know, send a text, book early. Um, I was running two boats, as you know, um, so I was able to, to have that kind of uh, ability with the, with the book to, to, to fill two boats worth, and now it's just me. And so my dates are a lot harder to get. Um, finding an awful lot of people like this season, I'm, I'm booked. It's a little easier to book up my calendar. So if you're going to come see me, please, you know, get a hold of me early. Pick your dates. Um, take a shot. There's no one better month than other. It's different every year. The guys that booked in late June this year that might have looked a little bit foolish in a few years past were the kings. They got the best bite of the year so far. It might get better, but they got like, you know, last bite 10 years. It was that good for, for a three-week time frame. You never know. So 
when you get an opportunity and then and the, and the, the, the fish gods allow, you use that advantage and hop aboard. You're going to learn something either way. You're yes, going to learn you're get a master's class in, in tackling sea monsters, and that I can attest to, and it's... It's something that everybody should experience if you're a fisherman. All right, so book early and often. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Sweet.